Good evening. We're calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, March 1st, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, the Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Glenn Diggins? Yes. And Dan Dunn? Yes. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate tr the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with Agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. This meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately, and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the meeting materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. And we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to our first item on our agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will in introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait till the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain items. After members have spoken, I as chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call in each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. That takes us to the next item on our agenda. Before we start, I just wanted to note for everyone, obviously this is a special meeting that we added given how late our last meeting went. I think the plan going forward, unless I have any objections from members, is to, we have a cutoff time of 11 o'clock, is to assume we are not gonna go past the 11 o'clock deadline for any of the warrant article hearings unless we get closer to town meeting and the situation necessitates it. But that is the plan as of right now, if, by a shake of the head, if that works for everyone just to avoid the yeah. Mr. Chair. Part. Yep. Uh, I, I totally like that plan. I would just say that one thing perhaps is that if we do choose to go past 11, that we should be careful to set what our next deadline is at that time. But I agree we should avoid it if we can. Yep. So I, hopefully we won't have that problem tonight by a long shot, but that's, that's uh, the plan as of right now. 
That takes us to the next item on the agenda. We have our consent agenda. We have minutes of meetings, February 8th, 2021. Do we have a motion to approve? Move approval. And Mr. Corsi? Second. All right, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. I abstain. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's 401. Thank you. All right. Next item on our agenda after under traffic rules and order and other business, we have a discussion of the Mugar property. So we added this back to the agenda just to have a little a discussion about additional details. I know some members have some comments that they want to make about the changes to the to the plan that has been presented to the ZBA. And you know, we've had a lot of neighborhood input on this continually, but in the past few weeks since we, we've sent the letter and since we've first we've last talked about this. I know we've all spoken to many, many residents who are really unhappy with the plan and the plan just at this point is just really a disaster for the area. So we just, this is just on for a general discussion. Um, I'm gonna turn to Mr. DeCourcy first. I know he went to a neighborhood meeting last night so he can give us an update with, and then have any comments he has. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so since our, we've been talking about this probably two out of the last three meetings, but on our meeting on January 25th, we voted to send a letter to the ZBA and that, that letter ended up uh, going out in, in early to, to mid-February with our continued concerns about the wetlands issues, the traffic issues, the general siting of the property. And, and we raised a new issue, um, which was the removal of the townhouses from Dorothy Road, which was supposed to serve as the transition between Dorothy Road and, and what initially was proposed as the apartment buildings behind it. Um, I attended a neighborhood meeting last, last night and the neighbors are continue to be um, very concerned about what is being proposed there, what the impact will be on their neighborhood, both environmentally, by traffic, and just in general lack of compatibility with the neighborhood. It's a very real concern. It's a legitimate concern. Um, and I know we're all concerned. This board has expressed its concern going back to the initial stages of the um, of this application back to 2015, where Mrs. Mahan and Mr. Dunn appeared at, at Town Hall back in August of 2015 at a public hearing to oppose what was then the original um, application. So if I could, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanna, we've received, I've received a number of questions since we sent out the letter about language that we used um, concerning our opposition to the removal of the townhouses. And I wanna focus in on that in particular this evening, there are continuing issues with traffic and wetlands and other environmental issues. But if I um, could take some time to talk about that and, and then open it up for discussion. Um, Mr. Chapterlin has a um, presentation that I'd like to, if we could share that screen, I'll just walk through it. Good. Okay, so yeah, so again, as, as I said, this is a follow-up to our February letter to the ZBA. Um, next screen, please. And again, among, among the, the number of um, items that we discussed uh, was our concern over the removal of the townhouses. We spent a couple paragraphs talking about that and really raising the doubt in our minds whether this project would have been approved had it been submitted initially without the townhouses because of the... Um, the transitional aspects that were cited uh, as for the justification for it. Um, next slide. Okay, and this is the exact language that we used from our letter. I'm not gonna read it exactly, but we're basically pointing out that it bears noting that the, the removal of the townhouses removes probably the only thing that was consistent with the neighborhood. And then it, it, we go on to state that uh, our doubts about what would happen if it had been removed from the initial application. Uh, next slide. This is a copy, and unfortunately, part of the picture looks like it's it's washed out there on, on the left side of the slide. So um, that is a copy of the actual mass housing project eligibility letter approval back from December of 2000, 
15. And in that letter, there are numerous instances where mass housing um, had findings related to building type density, massing, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, next slide. And again, specifically, what they were approving at that time was six townhouses on Dorothy Road and 207 apartment units, 150 feet off of Dorothy Road. Um, even with that, Mass Housing in their recommendation said that the applicant should be prepared to address municipal concerns well relative to size, scale and density of the project and its impact on the character of the surrounding neighborhood and fully describe the proposed measures to address and mitigate these concerns. And if you go to the next slide, there are now Mass Housing made specific comments um, about what was before them. And this again is right from the project eligibility approval letter. Mass Housing wrote, should you consider a change in tenure type or a change in building type or height, and this is before the comprehensive permit issues, you may be required to submit a new site approval application for review by Mass Housing. So let's summarize what happened at the beginning back in the 2015, 2016 time period. The original application called for rental and home ownership units. The building types were townhouses and apartment buildings. The current proposal, which has not been approved by the ZBA, but it's been submitted to them and it's been the subject of a number of discussions at, at the most recent meetings with the ZBA. The tenure type is rental only and the building type is apartment building only. No townhouses, no ownership units. You look at the top on the eligibility letter, it seems to me that the change of those two items raises questions whether a new site approval application should be submitted. Uh, next question, uh, slide, <laughs> next question. Again, I went through the December 2015 project eligibility approval letter. Um, there are at least four instances, mass housing cited the transitional nature of the townhouses and how their siting on Dorothy Road will complement the existing residential development and act as a buffer. These three blurbs there are again, right from the eligibility letter from page eight of Mass Housing's findings. And these are consistent with findings Mass Housing has to make the so-called so design guidelines. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is a, a subsequent um, message or, or finding that Mass Housing issued. This was from page nine of the eligibility letter. And, and Mr. Chapter, if you can go back to the previous slide for a second. The language on that next slide, if you look at the third blurb over to the, to the right, the language is almost identical. And I would view that in, in 11 page letter, there were four references to how the townhouses would complement the neighborhood and act as a buffer uh, between the existing neighborhood and what was being proposed. The fact that Mass Housing used identical language on two consecutive pages in my mind highlights the importance of the townhouses to the proposal, at least at the project eligibility stage. Uh, next slide. Okay, and I just I just pointed that out on, on page nine. Um, next slide. Here's a picture of what was submitted initially or a rendering of what was submitted initially to the ZBA. This is what the townhouse street elevations were proposed to look like. This is what was initially proposed to mass housing. And this is what was contained in the application currently pending before the ZBA. Uh, next slide. This is what is now before the ZBA. If you can go back, Mr. Chapdelaine for a second. Okay, that's the original six townhouses on Dora Road. Uh, next slide. Now what we see, and, and I would suggest that this rendering is in a, a light most favorable to the developer. Uh, it's their rendering. It shows the four tour hut that what you may think are toy houses on the left side of the screen there are the actual houses on Dorothy Road. What you see across 
from 58 Dorothy Road, which is the furthest house on the right, all the way down to the corner of Little John and Dorothy Road is what's being proposed for that site. No more buffer, no more transition zone, no more buildings that are compatible with the neighborhood. And that, that invisible ink or the, 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 the lightness that you see on the apartment, I can assure you will not be lightness if this building ever goes up. That was designed to show that those parts of the building aren't on the street frontage, but they're, believe me, they'll be there. Um, they'll be visible. And what we have here with this apartment building on the revised proposal that wasn't part of the application, that wasn't part of the project eligibility approval is a building that is now 23 feet off of Dorothy Road. The original proposal called for it to be 150 feet off of Dorothy Road. And I realize that this is a smaller building than what was proposed behind the townhouses, but it shows the general lack of comparability. And you can really see how, if this ever got put in, how it would overwhelm the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. This is what the revised proposal looks like. Um, again, it's not part of the application. It's been submitted to the ZBA. They've had discussions on it. It's one building. Um, that top edge of the, or the, the three closest wings that, that are near Dorothy Road are 23 feet off of, off of the street. Um, there's absolutely no comparability in my mind with the neighborhood. Um, there's no buffer. Um, there have been some changes made to this. The other thing I would point out is that there is a, um, you can't read it in the fine print, but Dorothy Road and Little John Road are, Little John Street are identified there as being 40 feet wide. Um, the street themselves, Dorothy Road is about 25 feet wide. Little John is about 25, 26 feet wide. Uh, it's nowhere near the width that, that may be suggested here. Um, next slide. This again is stating the obvious, the removal of the townhouses conflicts with both the mass housing project eligibility approval letter findings and the contents of the comprehensive permit application. Next slide. Yeah, yeah actually, if you can go back, Mr. Chapterling, to the previous one on, on the conflict. And, and so why is this important for the board? We, we realize that this matters before the ZBA. We have to respect the ZBA process. However, the select board had two opportunity or had an opportunity to comment on the initial plan back in 2015. And what was commented on was a different plan at the project eligibility stage. And the select board, or board of selectmen at that time, submitted two letters to mass housing before the project eligibility letter was granted. And there was very little attention given to the townhouses because at that point, the townhouses were compatible. And there was doubt expressed as to whether the townhouses would be a good enough transition from Dorothy Road to the apartments. Um, but the select board never had any opportunity to comment on what's now before the ZBA and what would have been before Mass housing had the initial, had what's being discussed now been submitted initially. And so why do I bring this up again as to the importance of this? And, and people may say, okay, once this is down this path, uh, select board doesn't have a role or you can't go backwards and take a look. And, and what I say to that is there are rules to what's submitted. And if there are changes made, as, as I pointed out, that change tenure type, building type, move things from ownership to rental. Those are substantial changes. And there is provisions to go back to mass housing in that situation to either get a ruling on whether this is a substantial change or get a ruling on whether a whole new application is submitted. And the design guidelines that I think would be applied had this property as proposed now, it, uh, would have been applied by mass housing may be similar to what Mass Housing did in another matter that we cited in our letter in Medfield, where Mass Housing denied a project eligibility application at the project eligibility level for a 182 unit development that was proposed for Medfield because it wasn't 
compatible with the neighborhood. Um, I'd like to have that shot again to, at this stage, to be able to comment on that. And since our meeting on January 25th, the ZBA met on January 26th, and there was a statement made at that hearing that, again, in my mind, gives even more importance to take the action that I'm gonna propose in a minute. Um, about two and a half hours into the meeting on January 26th, there was a question from a neighbor as to why the developer doesn't have to go back to mass housing and what, what the implications of the change are. And the attorney for the applicant talked about the final approval does have to go to, back to the subsidizing agency. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna read um, what Mr. Harvey said, who's a ZBA consultant working uh, for the town. The subsidizing agency will not do any sort of design review of the final year plans. That is only done during the project eligibility process. Whatever plans the board eventually approves, if they approve them, will be the final plans. The subsidizing agency won't make any changes to those. That's why we never had our opportunity to comment on this. This is a substantial change. Um, Mr. Chapdell, if you can go to the next slide. What I'd like to propose to the board, and I know Mr. Chairman, you talked about it being a discussion. I'd like to throw this out as a, a potential action on our part. Uh, given the applicant's proposed changes to the tenure and building types, the board urges the ZBA to request that the applicant submit a new site approval application for review by Mass Housing before any further action is taken on the revised proposal. Um, I have two more things beyond the slide, Mr. Chapter one, if you can put up picture one. This is a picture that a person driving down Dorothy Road took on February 28th. The area to the left is where the proposed apartment building will go. And I note that if it is approved, it will be the largest single apartment building in the town of Arlington. Um, this is supposed to be a two-way street in the drawing. It is a two-way street. In the drawings, uh, the renderings that I've seen submitted, there's a lot of activity going on in that street. Here's the activity that takes place when there's cars parked on one side of the road. You only can fit down one side. Um, next picture, please. This is a picture of the corner of Dorothy Road in Little John. The area to the left there where that telephone pole is, that is now the single entrance for the proposed 172 apartments. One entrance, all of the traffic at the end of the day was likely to go down Dorothy Road in order to enter this, um, this proposed site. So after meeting with neighbors, after looking over the history that this board has had with this property, the, the town's history in proposing it. And, and I, want, I want to cite Mrs. Mahan's comments at the uh, January 25th um, board meeting where, where she made a call for an aggressive stance in opposition to this. And you know, as a board, we've been consistent. Our predecessors have been consistently opposed to this. I see these changes that have been made to go way beyond um, what what should have been um, what what should be before the ZBA at this point. I'd like to to make the request of the ZBA, and I'd like to continue our opposition. And I appreciate the time that you gave me tonight, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Sorry, I'm, I'm set up on my um, husband's home work office and I'm literally between four different screens. So I apologize for taking so long. Um, first, I'd like to um, second what I think Mr. DeCourcy um, uh, made as a motion um, regarding, uh, I sort of see it as, and please correct me wrong, if I'm wrong, Mr. Chair, or Mr. DeCourcy, it's a two part motion with um, sort of a direction and or request to ZBA as well as mass housing, or is it a request to ZBA and they then um, 
make the request to Mass Housing. So, uh, Ms. Mr. Korsky can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the request is to urge the ZBA to tell the applicant that they have to submit a new request to Mass Housing with the revised plan because it's substantially different from the from the plan that was originally submitted. Okay, so 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 I will um, definitely second that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I do agree with um, all the um, materials uh, that uh, our colleague, Mr. DeCourcy has provided that this is a substantial change as well as sort of an anchor on the proposal that went to mass housing as Mr. DeCourcy outlined. Um, really a, a lot of their uh, project weight um, laid heavily on the uh, townhouses uh, buffer transition zone, which now is just a mere fragment um, of, of the plan that they have before us. And um, I know that the zoning board of, I shouldn't say I know, I believe that the zoning board of appeals next meeting is March 11th. Um, I would just ask, uh, and I'm assuming the answer is yes, that if we do, the board does, um, take this vote tonight that this message A could be um, relayed to the ZBA before uh, not necessarily the March 11th meeting, but the open meeting law so that they have the information at least 40 hours in advance of March 11th so that if they deem appropriate, uh, they could put it on their March 11th and or if they feel comfortable either if attorney Hine, attorney Witten, or somebody else can advise them that they already have an agenda item that they can discuss this under. And if they do agree with the select boards, if we do vote that way, action that um, mass housing needs to uh, reconsider this uh, or consider this as a new proposal because their previous approval was granted on something that no longer exists. Um, so I guess I would ask through you, Mr. Chair, uh, if Attorney Hine can give me some guidance on that and maybe more artfully frame what I'm trying to say. Sure, Attorney Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mrs. Mahan, if what you're asking is uh, whether the ZBA can be notified so they uh, place an item on their agenda in advance of the March 11th meeting, uh, yes, I, I think they can. that can be done. It can be done by myself. Um, directly um, after this meeting to the chair and vice chair, if the select board so wishes it, what would essentially then happen if the zoning board is inclined to agree is the applicant would basically have to describe their uh, revised proposal to the subsidizing agency and uh, would have to reach a decision with respect to substantiality. And I believe that this board would have an opportunity uh, to comment on that because uh, when they submit that uh, request to uh, review eligibility under their revised proposal, they're supposed to CC the um, zoning board and the chief executive body of the town. So yes, we can um, definitely uh, advise the chair and the vice chair of the zoning board that you'd like to have that uh, considered by the ZBA. And um, yes, that can be addressed on a March 11th meeting if the chair and vice chair are so inclined to put it on the agenda. Okay, and then, and then um, my last question, and then I'll not ask anything else. Um, besides, I, I definitely have seconded Mr. DeCourcy's um, motion is, um, I know when we submitted our, we believe we've reached the 2% request to HUD um, in my personal opinion, um, and maybe shared by others, including my colleagues, that um, we got penalized because of um, counting the water bodies as buildable areas. Um, in terms of that issue, is that pun in, intended dead in the water, or is that something um, we're still pursuing and could possibly have um, some positive movement on that? Um, I don't know if Attorney Hahn or Mr. Chapdelaine through the chair could answer that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that issue is preserved for appeal. So what would have to happen in order for that issue to come up again 
uh, but it, although it is preserved, is similar to like an appellate court uh, preservation of a trial court matter, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar with, Ms. Mahan, uh, being preserved for appeal uh, in a more conventional way. What would essentially happen is if the uh, applicant or anybody else appealed the ZBA's uh, determination on the permit itself, and that matter was litigated in the HAC, and the HAC's determination was appealed by the town, um, the town would have the right in superior court or, uh, or in court to um, assert that one and a half percent was wrongly decided and that we ought to be able to uh, establish local control, which would essentially mean that you'd remand it back to the ZBA for a decision consistent with that proceeding. Okay, so I think I think what I'm hearing is that that's something that's still on the table, um, but that we should keep it there for now um, and perhaps pursue that in the future, but I would leave it to uh, town council and any other more learned people than me. Uh, but I just wanna raise that, that that's, that's still something um, that I feel should be pursued, but at the appropriate time. I don't want to, you know, send all five bullet points over at the same time. We can do one at a time, but that's something that's available to us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. DeCorsi, just to clarify how we're going to notify the ZBA, do you want your motion to be that the board directs me as the chair to work with Attorney Heim to write a letter to the ZBA consistent with the language that you provided in your last slide? Yeah, no, I, I think that's appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, with, with any edits that you feel are necessary or any additional context. Sure. All right, Mr. Diggins? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman? Chairman yep. I'm sorry, Mr. Diggins, obviously defer to the board. Attorney Heim, go ahead. Um, if it would be okay with the board, I think it would be valuable given the fact that the 11th can sneak up rather quickly. I think it would be valuable to just authorize a more direct notice to the chair of the board alongside that more formal communication. Yep, that's okay. That's fine. Maybe I'm being over. Yeah, I'll, I'll amend right. my motion. That, 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 that. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you make a very good case, uh, Mr. DeCourcy. And so um, the brevity of my uh, comment here is inversely proportional to my support for the motion. Mr. Dunn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. That was indeed uh, very persuasive and very informative. Um, I just want to say, go on the record as saying that uh, I would have voted for the letter as written if I was on the board, just if that ever comes up as um, being a useful fact. Um, I My only uh, change that I'd want to make to, or not change, uh, augmentation to Mr. DeCourcy's motion is I think in the, in the past, when I was on the board, we went through great lengths to not offend the sensibilities of other boards by telling them how to do their business. And it's counterproductive to us if we do. And so I just want to, and if we look at some of our past letters with the ZBA, we've, we've gone through great lengths to remind ourselves and remind them what's our decision and what's their decision. And I know Mr. DeCourcy is not trying to insert himself into that. And I just wanna make sure that we keep that language and that tone when we uh, communicate this message. Mr. Corsi? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mr. Dunn. And, and I, I, I believe I said at the beginning of my comments tonight that this is the ZBA's decision. We respect their decision. This is a request of, of, of us to them. Um, so yeah, that's understood. And I hope, hopefully that's conveyed if, if anybody, any member of the ZBA is watching this evening. And would we, just in the mechanics of it, would we defer to the chair to draft and send such that we get it done in a timely way? So I think what Attorney yeah. Heim is suggesting is that he just go ahead and notify the ZBA tomorrow. But we can also, I can also work with Attorney Heim to put a letter together, but we'll notify them in the quickest way possible tomorrow. And then me and Attorney Heim will draft a letter that summarizes the language as the board suggested. So we have that in writing and we'll get that out in the next day or two too. Great. Yep. 
All right. And with that, I support everything that's been discussed here. Um, you know, thank you, Mr. Corsi, for putting together the PowerPoint. Everyone knows the project, but it's a lot easier to see the uh, the treacheries of the project when you can see it laid out in front of you like that. So, you know, I think it, this all makes sense and it's the next step that we need to take to make sure that the residents of that area aren't overburdened by a detrimental project that, like this. So I appreciate your efforts on this. Um, so Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, that takes us to a warrant article hearings, picking off where we left off at 12.15 a.m. last week. That we are on Article 80, Resolution Facilities Department Report, Clarify Responsibilities, Track Progress of the Department of Facilities and Maintenance, tabled from the, the February 22nd, 2021 meeting. Do we have Ms. Thornton with us? Ms. Thornton, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Let me get my, uh, um, uh oh. There. All right. And we do have, we did receive an email from you today that highlighted, I think, what you're going to tell us tonight. So if you just go, kind of go through the, the points of, of what you had sent us as to how you, you're going to, you lay out the suggestions for the, the seminary annual reporting for this article. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad to see you all looking rested. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, I thought that to, in the interest of time and to uh, make the whole meeting go faster, I would just jump to the end. I'm assuming that you have all read why I think the facilities department is so important. Uh, you've noted that the history that it was actually uh, started in 2015 uh, by an action of the select board at that time. Uh, I think there's a lot of long-term money and a lot of potential risk on the table for not paying close attention to facilities. And now we, we, we have a, a letter from uh, Jim Feeney, which I was very pleased to see, or an email, and we have a new facilities director coming on board. So I'm just gonna jump in and make a recommendation that the select board request that the new director or, or the director of the facilities department establish a tradition of a of two reports a year one for the uh, capital planning committee capital planning committee begins their annual work looking at the uh, needs of the departments and the schools in uh, early september of each year late August, early September. So it would be very timely for them to have on their desks a, um, a report from the capital plan, the uh, facilities department director about what he thought were the issues and what had gone the year before. The second report would be same, same basic framework, but maybe a, a little different orientation or recommendations would go to the select board six months later, and it would stipulate uh, the same kind of general information what has been accomplished in that last year, and, and recommendations that may be of special significance for the select board. All right. All right, with that, I will turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Dunn? Uh, thank you. Um, so Barbara, as I was reading about this and I was thinking about it, so the structure of this, if I'm following it, so actually, let me talk, let me start with the parts that I really agree with you on. Then I'll get to the parts where I'm not necessarily so much in agreement. Um, the facilities department is super important. I'm really glad that we built it. 
Um, and I, I remember back in 2015 when we started it, and it was a, it was a good process. We had a good facilities director. We had good progress and implementation. Then the position uh, went unfilled, and we had Jim Feeney fill in, and now we've got a new leader uh, of the of the department. And um, I agree that we should have some regular reporting from that group to the select board. Um, and so in a second, I'm gonna, through the chair, ask the uh, town manager um, what, he, what he thinks is an appropriate time frame for us to, to commit to. And then, but I'm not gonna do that quite yet because what I'm gonna do instead, but first I'm gonna talk about the part that I disagree with, which oh. at least make sure, if I understand it correctly, is that you're kind of asking us to recommend to town meeting, to have town meeting recommend to us what we should do. And we can skip to the steps and just agree with you and just make it happen without the town meeting part, if unless there's a, a nuance here that I'm missing. No, you got it. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, it would it be appropriate for the town manager to comment on uh, what reporting he thinks is appropriate that he'd be willing to commit to from his department? Yes, Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Barbara. Um, I, I think a semi-annual report, uh, if not identical, maybe very similar to what Barbara has described, makes very good sense. Uh, based on what Mr. Feeney put in his email, it sounds like a semi-annual report uh, is, you know, administratively doable uh, from his perspective. And I do like the alignment that Barbara described. Um, perhaps sometime in the July. August timeframe would be appropriate for that capital planning committee report, as Barbara knows from her many years of, uh, of service on the capital planning committee. Um, so, you know, probably having something done or ready by, the, by early August would make sense for transmittal mm -hmm. to the capital planning committee. That would then, of course, be available to the select board. And then maybe waiting six months right around the time that we would be submitting the town manager's operating budget on January 15th which of course is also inclusive of the capital budget, might be a good time to include a report from the facilities department to the board uh, that we could of course also share with the finance committee as they begin their uh, budgetary review process for the season. So yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I guess that was a long-winded way of saying, I like what's being proposed. Uh, and I think we could do uh, a midsummer and then midwinter reporting structure that could we could get into a nice cycle if we, if we start doing that. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Barbara. Mr. Higgins. Um, Ms. Thornton, thank you very much me, um, for, for, for bringing this to our attention and for um, educating me a lot me, about the history of this me, and, and the importance of it. Uh, and, and yes, I, I like what uh, Mr. Chaplain has suggested as a time frame. My only concern was um, plopping this onto the select board in the middle of, of, of March when we're doing all the hearings me for the articles might be just a little much. So having that come I mean, a bit earlier, I mean, late January, mid February, I think would really be good. And I, I look forward to uh, reading these reports and then discussing it with, with my colleagues on the board and you and others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, yes, I'd like to, um... I'm, mute. I'm unmuted. Yes. Uh, thanks to Ms. Thornton for, you know, hanging with us late and starting with us early here. Um, and I know uh, it's been over a year's time that you've put an awful lot of energy and um, uh, not study, energy and um, analysis into um, the resolutions that you've submitted to us. And what I would like to do is A, make a motion, B, ask a question. Hey, I think what I'm hearing is that um, I'd like to make a motion to move approval, but to change the September 1st date facilities report to capital planning CC to select board to August mm -hmm. and B, um, change the March 1st facilities report to select board CC to capital planning and finance committee to February. Is that what I heard from you? Um, so Ms. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Town Manager, or Mr. Chair, is there something else I'm missing? So, you know, we can look to hear from the other board members, but I think what Mr. Dunn was suggesting is that we have oh. a motion of no action and just tell Ms. Thornton that we're just going to go ahead and direct the 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 uh, building committee to the facilities department to make these reports to us 
without the resolution going through a town meeting. Okay, that, sorry, I missed that part. And then with what the town manager said regarding changing the September and March date. So then my question would be, um, from reading everything that Ms. Thornton and um, then interim facilities manager, now assistant deputy town manager, Mr. Feeney has submitted to us one of the things that um, I'm assuming is inherent in the language before us, but because I don't see the two specific words, categories in there, which from my construction background before my court reporter background is sort of a either report or a uh, pipeline placeholder for uh, warranty and recalls. So what I'd like to ask through the chair um, to Ms. Thornton um, in what you've submitted to the board and um, Mr. Feeney submitted to the board, um, where would tracking of warranty and recalls? Because I know one of the big things that has sort of plagued the town and school um, buildings in the past, not only has been maintenance, but has been um, keeping track of warranties and uh, uh, adjusting accordingly when those should be applied as well as I know there's been a lot of uh, building issues because the town or town slash school received notices that a certain part of a, a piece of equipment was subject to a recall and they give the information on here's what you need to do to get this part and or get the professional expertise out to install it, but there's really been no follow up on that. So what, well, I guess what I'm asking is, is that inherent in one of the um, bullet points and, and could you kind of point me towards that? Yeah, it is. This is there are so many things about this that are my favorite things. But one of the things that I think is critically important is the establishment and maintenance of a database. And in that database, and there are databases available. And the one we looked at years ago, and I'm not sure where where it is now, was had the unfortunate name of being called School Dude. Um, but there are there. Are, our databases and the databases do hold that kind of information. It not only tells you when the last time the, the roof was repaired on Dallin School, but it also tells you the warranty information for the boiler in Dallin School. And uh, so it's, it's all there and it's assembled in, an, in a good database that's interactive, that's easy to use for uh, information that you might want to share with a custodian or information that you might want to share with with Adam or, or the capital planning committee. Excuse okay, me. So are, are, you, are you saying that that is included in school dude because I used to do all the it was then AT and NET and T and then AT and T um, for all the trunk senders mainframes all the equipment that we had and I looked at school dude and I, I didn't see the capability there and that, that could be because I don't have the knowledge you're saying that school dude which that name just sends me whatever. The chaplain it, into that. It does yeah. have the capability to do that, Mr. Chaplain. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and three to Ms. Mahan. Yeah, let me start by agreeing that it's a terrible name. Uh, I that can't still can't believe they've built a business with that name, but they are for uh, public sector best sort of best in class database for facilities management and maintenance. Uh, and my understanding is yes that they can track along with age, uh, life expectancy, uh, preventative maintenance schedules, they can also track the scheduling of warranties and recalls. And what I, what I would suggest is that that type of reporting would probably be most appropriate in the reporting to the board in that February timeframe, because I think the, the summer reporting to capital planning uh, could and should be very project-based. As Barbara had mentioned, what's been accomplished over the past 12 months and what do we think we can accomplish in terms of capital investment, uh, whereas I think the January, February report will be more operating focused and look at what um, you know, what 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 is on deck, what's in the database, what's the work to do, and what are we what are we budgeting to do that work from an operating point of view. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave that to the town manager to the previous facility director. When I asked for that information, um, from what I was told, school dude didn't have the capacity to track that, but I know we now have a new facilities director. And by previous, I don't mean Jim Feeney. He was <clears throat> act, sorry, acting um, director. But if you could just follow up on that, um, 
uh, Mr. Chair, with uh, the town manager, just to make sure that's the case, because that's really a vital um, um, part. And I know when the new facility director um, appeared before us at the last meeting, that's also a point that I raised to him. And he said uh, he believed that was the case, but that um, he would let us know. So, and, and I'm not saying anything untoward, but I'm just saying if school dude, or maybe we can call it something else like, you know, Chad Wolf, well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm done. All right, Mr. Diggins. Uh, I think you mean Mr. DeCourcy, I've already spoken. Oh, Mr. DeCourcy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, no, I, I support Mr. Dunn's motion and, and um, the, the, I appreciate the comments from, from Mr. Chapdelay in terms of a proposed timetable. And thank you, Ms. Thornton, for coming back and then improving on the original article to, to, to move towards a, a semi-annual type, type reporting. So I, I, I think we're in a good place uh, tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Crystal clear for Attorney Hines. Mr. Dunn, do you wanna make a motion of no action? Uh, I move to recommend no action. And Mrs. DeCourcy, you're seconding that motion? Second. Sure. Yep. And I agree with this. And thank you, Ms. Thornton, for bringing this up. And you know, I think this also highlights a few things. One, the need for reporting and the need to have easier communication with the select board for issues like this, where we, we can, you know, if there's a, a gap in reporting that we can reach out to our facilities department, you can come directly to us rather than having to go through the the warrant article process and we can certainly work on that going forward but thank you for this and i think this will be will be uh, very beneficial to us and all the residents to get semi-annual statuses of our, our facilities department all right with that this is a public hearing if anyone wishes to speak on this item please use the raise hand function in your zoom application we have one we have arthur Prakash. All right, Mr. Prakash, can you hear us? Yes, hi. Thank hi. you. Can you tell us your name for the record? Yes, Arthur Prakash. I'm on Thorndike Street in East Arlington. Thank you. You can go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so I just want to briefly comment that I urge the select board to treat climate mitigation and resilience as uh, an emergency, both uh, symbolically by endorsing this resolution and practically in its actions. And uh, specifically for East Arlington and a large part okay. of the Can I just say, yes. are you speaking on the climate crisis warrant article? Yes, I was trying to, I believe that uh, Warrant Article 90, 91 was next. Right, so we'll have a uh, public comment on that article once we review. My apologies. No problem, thank you. Nothing further. All right, and I do not see any additional hands on this article, we'll close public comments. So we have a motion of no action by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Corsi, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. A rare yes for me on a no action vote. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mrs. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. All right, and that takes us to Article 87, Resolution Overnight Parking Waiver for Residents of Multifamily Dwellings. Precinct four table from our February 22nd, 2021 meeting. And do we have this? Ms. Dominguez with us? Hi, Mr. Dominguez, can you hear us? Hold on. Hi. Um, um, my name is Sylvia Dominguez and I'm the, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can. Okay. 
I'm, I was just, uh, this is my first year as a town um, meeting member, and I'm very proud to um, represent Precinct 4, who, which I think it's a very special precinct. And um, my name is Sylvia Dominguez, and um, um, 87 and 88, I think, could be uh, seen together. Sure. Both regarding parking. Yep. In uh, Precinct articles. 4. And uh, basically, I just want to say that uh, Precinct 4 is really like a parking lot for commuters, for Elwife, and I really want to do to help my neighbors um, do better with this. Um, I've also conducted a, um, a um, what you call it, a survey of uh, my neighbors. But I've also had conversations with a couple of you and most lately with uh, Stephen DeCurcy who's um, uh, told me uh, we can work on this. So I really look forward to, to work with the uh, board this spring and summer. Um, and um, I'm more than willing to withdraw these as resolutions considering that. All right, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mingus. We did speak a couple of times and, and, and what I told Mr. Mingus is um, that these two areas, they, they are under the, the purview of the select board. And while I couldn't guarantee any action on behalf of the board, I certainly would be willing to work to put this on an agenda um, for her to present to us. So I, I think that was satisfactory to her. And, and I think um, with a comment to that effect, I'd move no action on, on, on both of them. Thank you. And Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'm really glad to hear that that conversation happened. And uh, because this is one of those ones that's really sticky, because uh, what I understand what we're looking for here but it's a very, it's a, the problem is that the solution that's proposed is pretty expensive. Um, but at the same time, I really love creative thinking and I hope that we can come up with a way that uh, solves the parking problems for the residents and doesn't, um, a, 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 you know, and also has a, the, you know, appropriate sized drain on the town resources. So I'm really, I, I look, and I've always wanted in previous, and I've never successfully done it, to try like pilot programs with different, areas and if that's one of the ideas that we tackle i'd love it mrs mahan um th thank you mr chair and thank you Ms. dominguez um i had corresponded with her by email promising to give her a call and did not do that so i apologize but i will make sure that i do do that um and um I just would say I would love to do a pilot program somewhere. I know that um, George Late, who was a chairman with LC Fiori at the East Island Neighbor Committee, tried for years, including with um, Ms. Dominguez's father, um, that when they would talk to um, residents in precincts in East Islington, and they would say yes, but then sort of one of the um, hallmarks or, or bellwethers of the select board has been uh, a neighborhood that wants to embark on some sort of trial period to get two thirds uh, of the neighbors to sign on to a petition. And um, what had happened in the past, which maybe not might not happen here in the present, is that when it came to um, putting their name on a petition and um, it was hard to get to the two thirds. So um, I'm not saying that that's the standard by which um, this current board will uh, look in terms of uh, a, a trial. It's something that I, as of right now, stand by. Uh, we do it with other similar efforts in terms of um, private way abatements and repaving the road. Um, but I look forward to um, definitely having a conversation with Mr. Dominguez um, and discussing this at future uh, select board meeting or meetings. But I think really uh, the big thing is going to be uh, actually getting at least two thirds of the neighbors in a, in, in a pilot program actually signing the petition, not, not, not word of mouth saying, oh, I, I think that's a good idea. So that's a hurdle we all have to work on. And I, I, I'm committed to work on that also. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to you, Mr. Chair, I have a question for Mr. Dominguez. Uh, um, 
So what's the parking situation now, nowadays, I me mean, since the pandemic? Well, right now it's really not an issue, um, but when the pandemic is over, uh, I think we'll have um, the usual situation. Okay, so the parking is not an issue. What about the ban on overnight parking? Is that an issue still? Um, that's very selective and arbitrary. Um, it's just arbitrary and it's uh, so on some people are able to park overnight and nothing happens other people get ticketed. Um, but there is um, the, we're still, you know, under that particular rule. Right. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt me. I wasn't really talking so much about the enforcement of it as much as it is the issues associated with having no overnight parking. Not having overnight parking is a serious problem for uh, residents of this precinct because most of these houses here are two and three family. There's only a, uh, a handful of one family homes here. There's lots of people who park in the same driveway, maybe even four or five cars. And then they have to wake each other up to get out or to go to uh, appointments. I mean, there's lots of appointments that are lost, people who are late for work because their people upstairs, their neighbors upstairs uh, don't get the car out in time. Um, right. Also, when we get the cars out, there's nowhere to put them because starting, because of the overnight, the, the streets are empty for the commuters. So right. our streets are full from seven o'clock until seven o'clock, 7.30 at night. Right, and so that's why I was asking. So with the, with the lack of use of the streets, it, um, due to people not parking there because of the pandemic. I was just wondering if maybe that overnight me kind of, um, um, I wanna say musical chairs, it's not quite the right analogy, but that over uh, shuffling you know, was, was alleviated somehow. But okay, well, well thank you very much. Uh, so uh, as I've mentioned uh, to Mr. Wingers and other people uh, about this and similar issues, I mean, the town has embarked on a sustainable transportation um, plan in, and and even though we, parking wasn't one of the prominent parts of it, we, uh, uh, it is a part of it. And, and it's I mean, when we uh, release the plan uh, probably in the next couple of months, I mean, that's not gonna be the end of the process. And, uh, we will be able to uh, continue um, working on our sustainable uh, transportation plan. And so that's gonna be an uh, avenue for us to uh, use to pursue this feed and and uh, you know it's, it's kind of challenging sometimes in the position of leadership. Like when do you follow the the majority, and when do you say, okay, we've heard from the majority, but this is what we need to do um, for the benefit being of, of everyone. So we've had these referendum or referenda, and you know, man, the voting has been um, in favor of maintaining the overnight parking ban, uh, but it's non-binding. And, and as Mrs. Horsey has said, this is uh, in the realm of the select board and, and it may be sometimes that we have to do something, things that the majority have voted against, you know, I mean, that's part of leadership, but we will process that and we'll think about it and, and we'll work on it. Uh, and, and hopefully we can come to uh, a better way of dealing with the situation I mean, for we're precinct four in all over the town. So thanks. Yep, and I just wanna thank Ms. Dominguez for bringing this issue. I know this is an issue that's prevalent for a lot of people in that area. Um, I look forward to you know, future discussions about a pilot program. Um, you know, I don't know that we can do a pilot program specifically for overnight parking. I think it might be more geared to your second request because I think you know, that's a, an issue that hits a few more than one precinct. So, or if we were to do that, it would have to be a specific, a broader base than just precinct four. But we did, um, to Mr. Diggins's question, in our last meeting under correspondence received, we had a, an email that was sent to me by Mr. Eamon Keating, who is also a precinct four resident. And his concern was that in the, during the pandemic, instances of where this area has a lot of tandem parking with this up and down residents who, as Ms. Dominguez said, they 
might have each other's car keys under normal circumstances and they just move the cars so they can get out if somebody wakes up at six in the morning and the other person wakes up at nine in the morning they don't have to deal with that in in the pandemic they're having issues where people don't want to be in other people's cars right for social distancing issues so he did bring up a point that we would have to discuss at a future meeting which i could put on the agenda just to see if there's any action we can take imminently regarding that specific issue and that would just be in the realm of enforcement of the overnight parking ban during the pandemic but i just want to throw, I, i'm not asking for any action on that right now but i just i there is concern from residents of this area that the overnight parking ban is causing a burden on their ability to you know switch cars and safely uh, distance from even their neighbors um, but I look forward to these conversations. We did prior to the pandemic, we were having a lot of conversations about the overnight parking ban and just parking in general, which I, we kind of got sidelined with all that was going on. But as we move through this, I think, you know, around the spring and the summer is a good time to, to take this up again. So I want to thank Ms. Dominguez to bringing this to our attention and look forward to working with you on this issue um so with that this is a public hearing we have one hand that's raised by darcy debney Ms. chaplain ms debney can you hear us i can that just that did something very odd um okay uh i'm actually a precinct four resident um we have two cars and we tend to park uh, and I'm also on the Sustainable Transportation Planning Committee. Um, and uh, eliminating overnight parking, just the par overnight parking prohibition, it just encourages more cars in town. And that is not part of the Sustainable Transportation Plan. It's not something where you want to give them any more reason to have more cars in town. We already have for about a decade, we've had a fairly steady population of about 40,000 plus people and 35,000 registered cars. That means we have way more registered cars than registered drivers to begin with. So I don't think we want to be encouraging that. The other thing is, um, and there are a bunch of other reasons why overnight parking ban is still a good idea. And the snow, the recent snow will have emphasized that to some people. The other thing is, it, it's not clear to me why the commuter parking problem from Alewife has been a problem and the solution on most of these uh, East Arlington streets in this particular neighborhood near is to have two hour parking limits on the street and that worked just fine. Um, and it, it may need a little enforcement now and again, but it's not, there's no reason to say we have to go to something like Cambridge and have a visitor permit that you have to ask for. And what if you're having a visitor? If you have two visitors, do you have enough permits for them? All that kind of stuff. I really don't think that Arlington wants to get into it when we could so easily solve the commuter problem by saying two hour limit or four hour limit even if you like. Um, but that seems to work. I mean, you can check with the police department and see if they think it seems to work, but it I've lived on Thorndike Street for a lot of years and it definitely worked when we started putting them in. And now I think it may just be a, a matter of sort of pushing the two hour limits out a little further from Alewife because if you get it a certain amount away from Alewife then people start gonna bother. Um, but I'm, I do live in Precinct 4 and I, I do tandem park and is it an irritating thing? Yes. Is it an inconvenience? Yes. That's not a reason to get rid of either overnight parking or to establish a whole permit parking system. Right. Just my opinion. Thank you. And we have Sarah Ogood. Hi, thank you very much for taking my call. I'd just like to respond to the previous say, comment. Ms. Ogood, if you could say your name for the record. 
Yep, my name's Sarah Allgood. I'm also a precinct for inhabitant. I live on Dorothy Road down close to Little John Street. Uh, so in the area of the proposed Thorndike development, Thorndike Place development. And I would just like to add to the previous comment that even as far away from alewife as we are, it's a huge issue pre-pandemic and it is starting to come back with over spill of alewife parking. Um, I think enforcing a two hour parking would be ideal as long as that did not apply to residents. It's bad enough that we cannot park on our own street overnight. So not being able to park on the street during the day as well would be very restrictive uh, to many of us. Um, so I would uh, request that the select board take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And we will have these discuss. We have a vote of no action on the articles before us. These discussions will will be ongoing as to you know what if any actions we take. So we're not taking any any actions whatsoever on parking with the vote that we're taking. We're just taking a vote of no action on the two warrant articles that are ahead of are proposed before us. With that, I see no further hands, so we will take two separate votes. So first will be a vote of no action on Article 87. Attorney Heim? This is Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Shannon's vote. Thank you. Now we will take a vote of no action on Article 88. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Dominguez. All right. Thank you. That takes us to Article 90, Resolution Pro program to install electric vehicle charging stations tabled from our February 22nd, 2021 meeting. Do we have, oh, this is Ms. Dominguez as well, sorry. Thank you so much, Chairman. Um, yes, this is another issue that I ran on uh, as well as parking and anti-racism and affordable housing. So here we go, sustainability and climate change. So, um, I've been a uh, electric vehicle driver for now about seven years. And the reason that I wrote this warrant is because there is initially because there's no, um, there is no charging station, no charging uh, offered anywhere in East Arlington. Okay. Which seems kind of crazy to me considering the density we have here and the fact that the lots are small and very few people can actually charge at home. Um, and I also, um, I'm keeping in line with the fact that we have a net zero for 2050, but also President Biden has been talking about 2035. So it's only a matter of time before this is a real super issue. Um, electric vehicle sales are um, increasing by 30% a year. And, um, I think it's necessary for the town to start looking at an actual budget item uh, and not only um, what Ken uh, Pruitt does, which is to put together grants to pay for these. Um, because this is just something that's gonna overwhelm the town at some point because electric vehicles are, so, are selling so much. So um, that's the reason that I put this together and um, I'm hoping um, that this occurs um, because this is a serious issue. Uh, and starting with East Arlington, of course, I hope we, I hope we get one soon in, in this neighborhood. All right, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know we have this article and then we also have the following article, Article 91, which um, the select board designee to net zero. We had that discussion 2050 versus 2035. 
um, park, I'm, I'm blanking on its name, Why? as well as um, something else, but also as a member of um, the Long Range Planning Committee, which is chaired by our colleague, Mr. DeCourcy, we've been having discussions regarding um, what our budget looks like going forward um, and need to have some really serious discussions around this. So um, I guess what I would do is, um, I, I know it's a resolution, but I, I don't wanna you know, move action on a resolution that um, doesn't identify a funding source as well as a site for this. Uh, so I guess I'm sort of floundering here. I don't know if the, either the chair or through the chair or Mr. Chapdelaine um, can sort of give, give me any guidance on this. I don't, I, I don't want to say no action. I'm fine for saying move approval, but I, I don't want to move approval when um, we haven't outlined a, a pathway to A, designate an area or areas and B, find a funding source, which right now I'm not going to go into the ex extensive conversations we've had in long range planning. Yeah, I think it would be good for Ms. Chaplain to just give us an update of where we are in charging stations and what the future looks like and, and where the money for those charging stations will come from. Ms. Chaplain? Absolutely. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Dominguez, for, for filing this. Uh, I guess I would first say, um, although I, I'm sure it's not uh, immediately convenient to Ms. Dominguez, there is a public charging station in East Arlington at the Gibbs School parking lot. Um, it's, avail it's not available during school hours, but all non-school hours, it is available to the public for charging. So we have made uh, at least one uh, investment in East Arlington in public charging. Um, that being said, I think, I, uh, I guess I'd say a few things. One, um, we've not yet spent significant town money on implementing any of these charging stations because of the availability of grants. And we've also, I think, been a leader in the region and in our installation of charging stations, but also trying not to get too far ahead of what the charging needs might be. Uh, and, you know, frankly, upsetting apple carts with removing parking spaces that are only available for electric vehicles. So I, I think in terms of this resolution, I'd say a few things. One, I think a vote of town meetings supporting uh, a broader installation of electric vehicle charging stations could be a powerful tool uh, for our budget planning in years ahead. Um, and it would give us sort of the imprimatur of, uh, imprimatur of town meeting to be able to go forward and plan in that manner. I think I would suggest though that the board consider in any language in a final resolution being subject to budgetary consideration by the Capital Planning Committee and Finance Committee so that Ms. Mahan's concerns are addressed. Uh, I could see this um, being something that the Capital Planning Committee could consider in future budget years, but of course it would be subject to balancing the capital budget and the availability of funds. Um, so I think, again, I would say overall, it. It's something we are working on. Having town meeting support would only aid in that work, but having it be considered in the context of our larger budget would also be appropriate, in my opinion. Thank you. Ms. Mahan? Okay, um, I thank the town manager for that clarification. So, um, and I know attorney Heim will be the person who has to put pen to paper and, and craft that. So um, I would move approval. And Ms. Dunn. Still thinking this one through, uh, I'll pass for now. Yep, Ms. Diggins. I'll second it, you know, and, and um, I, but uh, uh, through, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to um, um, my colleague, Ms. Mahan, uh, I have a question. So um, what's um, net zero thinking about um, in terms of um, charging stations? Um, being my first, I think I've been on it two months okay. <laughs> on the committee because I just recently got on that. Right. And I know that we'll have someone who speaks under article um, 91, but they, they do have a, a comprehensive plan um, around net zero and actions that could be taken. And Ken Pruitt, who is a, a works out of the planning department is sort of overseeing this with um, other members of the committee that's sort of enveloped in terms of 
plans moving forward. But again, we had this discussion, um, which the town manager, uh, Ms. Chapteling, was also at. Um, the big thing is um, first getting uh, the net zero plan through with the, with the 2050 um, and the action steps that fall in line with this, which um, I don't recall having a specific discussion regarding charging stations. My take would be it's probably included there somewhere. And I just wasn't at that meeting because I wasn't on the committee yet. Um, but so I, I don't want to re represent. I can tell you what I know about net zero and what's coming up in the, in the next Warren article and um, declaring a climate emergency and things like that. But I can't go beyond that. So I don't know if Mr. Chapdelaine, who I know has attended those meetings um, for several years versus my two months. <laughs> Chapdelaine? So first I'd say Ms. Mahan hit it right in the head. There will be a very thorough presentation to the board on the Clean Energy Future Plan, but we actually <laughs> explicitly discussed at the last meeting how the, the agendas are very packed and we were gonna wait until we've gotten through these agendas. But I will, um, if you'll indulge me, I'll just read. There's a, a number of areas, net zero buildings, zero emissions mobility, and, and then other measures being recommended, but there's specifically one for zero emissions mobility. It's number two. And it's, uh, I'll just read you that the, the bold type is create and implement a plan to expand public vehicle charging options at libraries, business districts, public parking facilities, and other facilities, both on and off street. So there, there's a greater description in the plan to talk about that effort, but uh, there is an explicit measure included in um, the proposed clean energy future plan or the net zero by 2050 plan, excuse me, uh, to expand our charging infrastructure in town. Gotcha. Thank you very much. You know, well, I mean, as with being uh, uh, a, a lot of the resolutions, you know, the, the, yeah, the articles that are resolutions, uh, the town is either moving in that direction in, or we as the select board can accommodate me in short order, uh, but uh, I'm gonna get back into my old ways of, um, I seconded, I'm gonna stick with the second. Uh, so, uh, and and I mean, unless I hear something um, really overwhelming later on in the hearing process, I mean, I'll vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I, given the comments from Mr. Chapdelaine and, and Mrs. Mahan, I'd, I'd support this. The only question I have for potential motion is on the funding, if we want to elaborate and, and say town and or outside grant funding. I don't know if that's helpful at all, Mr. Chapdelaine, in terms of sources to, to um, you know, put, put both of those in there. I think it is. Um, I, I think we're still in an environment where either from the utilities state grants or potentially even private grants, there's a lot of monies that we could use um, externally to help us do this. Uh, so I think it would be helpful to make it, make it clear that we're looking at multiple funding sources. Okay, thank you. So if I could add that, if that's okay with Mrs. Mahan, if I could add that language for the, uh, just to um, put before the funding in the resolution or the potential final resolution. Ms. Mahan? I would, take, I would take that as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you. And I will just say that, I mean, I, I know we're trying to toe the line of the resolutions to, sorry. Sorry about that. Live TV here, folks. <laughs> so we're trying to toe the line of, you know, resolutions that are duplicating efforts we're already made. But I think based on Mr. Chaplain's recommendation, it's certainly something that would, is worthwhile to bring to town meeting for a vote. Um, and given that Elon Musk is now the wealthiest man in the world, there's certainly gonna be a, a need going forward. And I think Arlington is sort, sort of an epicenter for that uh, transition to electric vehicles. So I, it was, we hear a lot of people telling us that, that we need more electric charging stations and we know it's in the works, but I think this is worthwhile to reiterate that for for the folks. Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I found I found my thoughts. Uh, uh, and as someone who threw some money at uh, Mr. Musk many years ago and, uh, and it delighted us, I, 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 you all remember I bought my picked up my Model 3. It was one of the first ones and I can't be happier with it. 
But the, on to the issue. Uh, I'm definitely happy to support Mrs. Mahan's motion. Mrs. Mahan, I would wonder if you'd consider, um, and the, the one thing that I think that was really kind of sticking with me is that I'm not comfortable with specifying that East Arlington is first. I would prefer that we write something, but I also agree that it should be equitable. And you know, if we think, and that means, and so I, I would hope that the uh, motion would should talk about, um, you know, intelligent and equitable or thoughtful and equitable distribution of locations rather than trying to specify regions where it should happen first. I would also take that as a friendly amendment. So the attorney Heim could also incorporate Mr. DeCourcy as well as Mr. Dunn's Thank amendments. You. Mr. Chairman? Right. Yes, Attorney Heim. So my understanding is that I'll obviously take the, um, as with other resolutions we discussed last week, I will take the balance of the board's comments. I'll try to work with Ms. Dominguez to make sure that the resolution is consistent with both the board and her intentions for it and craft something to come back for final words and comments. Yes. Thank you. And this is a public hearing. So if any members of the public would like to speak, use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now. Yeah, we do not have any public commentators. We have a motion by Mrs. Mahan, second by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Got me there. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Nana spoke. Thank you, Ms. Dominguez. Thank you. With that, that takes us to Article 91, resolution to declare a climate emergency in the town of Arlington, tabled from our February 22nd, 2021 meeting. We have Mr. Wild with us. Mr. Wilde, if you can say your name for the record. Hi, I'm uh, Park Wilde, and I'm in uh, Precinct 5 in East Arlington. Sorry for the pronunciation. If you could just tell it's, us it's quite all right. I answer to that. All right. And if you could just tell us about your article. Yeah, uh, th thanks a lot for having me on. And th you could just hear already, even earlier in the meeting, all the interest that there is in uh, climate issues. Um, a lot of the information that's more detailed, we sent in advance. And there's a there's a website, emergencyarlington.org, and also a video that kind of goes through the five planks of this proposed uh, Arlington Declaration of Climate Emergency, um, one by one. So I'll answer any questions you have about any of them, um, but I won't sort of take you through uh, the five uh, one by one at this point. Um, the, the key issue is that the issue that the issue of the climate emergency really is important and we shouldn't be immobilized. There really are things that, that even though state actors are important, national actors are important, there really are great things that Arlington can do. And I think it's going to make us feel good to um, work, work together and to have kind of an umbrella declaration that sort of states what is really our intentionality as a, as a community to do something about this issue. Um, it would place Arlington in good company. Other, other municipalities and uh, towns in Massachusetts have been making this type of declaration just in 2020. We have Boston, Acton, Wellesley, Lexington, and a lot of our other peer communities. Um, early on, trying to get organized around around this potential declaration we we put together a small committee and the early advice we had was that we had to talk to the people who've been doing such great work already on climate issues in Arlington we couldn't be just the Johnny come latelys and expect uh, every, everybody to all of a sudden do our thing. And we took that very much to heart. And so we've been having a series of uh, community events and stakeholder meetings um, that have led to um, first us adapting our, our proposal, uh, listening to many of the stakeholders, but then also getting endorsement from uh, East Arlington Livable Streets in October, Mothers Out Front in January, Sustainable Arlington and the Clean Energy Future Committee, um, which Ms. Mahan is on, um, uh, in February. And so um, each, each of these has had a chance to influence uh, this, this proposal. Um, 
if I were in your shoes, you know, this being Arlington and not some other place in the country, country I think the issue isn't going to be, is this important enough? Uh, but I would anticipate that you've probably got two questions on your mind. One is, is this going to contradict the good work that the town is already doing through the net zero by 2050 plan? And the other is, probably not, is it going to contradict it, but is it kind of redundant with it, right? Like if we have, if Arlington's town government is already in favor of net zero by 2050, um, do we still also have to do this declaration? And my answer is we've taken care to avoid uh, both of those problems. Uh, for example, we don't have a year statement in this Arlington Declaration of Emergency that contradicts the net zero by 2050, um, but we really do have a distinctive expression of urgency. And kind of a particular way of doing the public education and outreach that I think is going to help the town um, and to help the folks who are um, most strongly promoting the net zero by 2050 plan just by giving it um, an umbrella or a wrapper that makes that drives it home um, to people. What is Arlington really about as it does kind of the dozens of individual measures? You know, um, uh, Ms. Dominguez was, was mentioning uh, uh, charging stations for electric uh, cars. Each of these is on the um, net zero by 2050 plan as one of the one of the bullets in the plan. Um, but I think that this Arlington Declaration of Climate Emergency helps to make the big point in a way that's going to be salient to people. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Wildy. Um, well, it. I am going to be inclined to um, support it. Uh, but um, just a couple of questions. What is it that individuals can do it, um, that you feel that we aren't doing it, that would make a difference? And I'm not saying that, it, that we as Arlington are gonna move the needle, but, but it, this is just to amp it up, I mean, in our consciousness, but we wanna do more than that. We want people to actually take action. So what are maybe one or two things I mean, that we as individuals can do? And then what are one or two things that it, we as a town can do, either the, uh, the government entities, I mean, as a select board or, or departments I mean, that you feel that we aren't doing that would be beneficial? The first thing is, that's just a terrific question, because so often you get individual action pitched against kind of political action or policy action, but you, you've wisely asked me about both, right? So for individual actions, you know the list of like 101 good things you can do for the environment, and lots of them are very small impact. Um, but the big things that have a big impact are the things that people in our community can do that substantially reduce our fossil fuel use. So if you think about driving less, if you think about flying less, if you think about uh, uh, making the home energy um, uh, fossil fuel burn less, those, those are the things that make the biggest difference. But the key thing is don't stop with just those personal choices. Focus on trying to encourage town government, state government, federal government, to really take action because it can't be just a thousand and one points of light like you know in the Reagan administration it has to really be government action that makes a difference in our times. You're so enthusiastic you know, I love it I love it you know it's about an important about an important issue you know and, and so uh, it, it like I said I I, I would generally, I would prefer to see me something really concrete me that, that we as the town me, could take on me I, and we're doing it. And, uh, um, and, and so, uh, so I encourage you, whatever happens when, with, with this resolution to just keep up the energy and keep me figuring out ways that we as individuals and as a government and, and the barracks departments can do more. So um, I am going to move my uh, approval. Yeah, thank, you. Just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll second Mr. Diggins' motion. And uh, thank you, Mr. Wilde. And, and uh, uh, thank you for your outreach as well, because I had heard as this process was going along, there was some, some questions and it sounds like you've worked with some uh, various stakeholders and made some changes and uh, that there seems to be general consensus on this. So thank you very much. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could third it, I would, <laughs> but I can't. Um, 
Uh, we just had a meeting last week of the Clean, Ed Clean Energy uh, Future Committee, as Park has pointed out, um, and there was a very detailed sort of matrix um, of all the different action steps. I can't remember if it was 11 of 31 pages, um, but uh, as of our meeting last week, it, it is a public document and it does outline um, specific um, action steps, whether it be charging stations, whether it be uh, economically, not economically, environmentally um, friendly vehicles purchased by the town. And we also included the schools, not the school curriculum, but the school, town school, because uh, originally the way it was written, um, it was just assumed that school was under town, but we also added and school to um, tie into that. Again, not getting into the school curriculum, which has already been taking some of those steps. And uh, one of the things there was, as I said previously, there was discussion around 2050 versus 2035 and Park can probably give a better recitation um, in terms of the conversation around that, but I, I'm just going to say what I, what my takeaway was, and if he could speak to that briefly, um, A, around these steps, uh, Ken Pruitt, who is in our planning department, has had conversation with Charlie Foskett, but the, the 2050 versus 2035 had to do with different groups getting them up all under our umbrella. Pa, pa, can you say it better than I'm saying? Right. So, so the, 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 these these quest there's there's just a lot of the details that are that are kind of really important and interesting. But just to touch on the two that Ms. Mahan mentioned, one one is um, about uh, what what town organizations are kind of being called upon by town meeting in this resolution to act on climate. And the answer is all of them, that it's not really just the select board, it's, it's the select board and the school board and the zoning board. Um, but part of our stakeholder outreach was talking to um, Attorney Heim and Attorney Heim explained to us, he, he sort of checked with us to make sure that we didn't have exaggerated expectations that just because the town meeting passes this resolution that all of a sudden the zoning board is allowed to break its, uh, its rules. And the same is true for this question about the, um, the school district. So this really does include the school district, um, but it doesn't mean that all of a sudden the, um, the superintendent has been disempowered or that the school board is disempowered. Uh, this is a call on each of them to do, do to act in their own area. For example, in the schools, the town is working very hard to have the um, new school construction for the high school meet a very high um, energy standard. And I think that's a considerable considerable success. The second thing is, could we have said 2035? If, if I were king, <laughs> I would have said an earlier date than 2050. Um, but it was very clear for a number of reasons that, that what we wanted to write this in a way so that all the people in the town who had already been putting long hours of work into net zero by 2050 um, could also support this without seeming like they're supporting two contradictory things. So you could think of this proposal as being kind of like net zero by 2050, but with a special tone of urgency. All right, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am happy to support this motion. I think that uh, there are times when you know specificity is important, but then there are times when it really matters to capture the tone of town meeting because it gives a uh, moral authority to other decisions that are being made in town. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of decisions over the next few years that we can say, yeah, and we got this resolution from town meeting and that's why you should support it. And I think that that's a, a very powerful statement. And thank you, Mr. Wildey, for the presentation. Certainly your enthusiasm for this subject is, is really impressive and the detail that you provide for it to support this. This is an incredibly important issue for the town, for the town residents. And I think this is, you will find broad support in town meeting. So I'm happy to support this. This is a public meeting. We have two hands raised. Do we have Mr. Burkhart? Uh, 
Mr. Burkhart, can you hear us? Hi, sorry about that. Can you just say your name for the record? Yeah. Hi, my name is John Burkhart. I live uh, in Westminster Ave. Yep. Heights. And i um, very encouraged by the comments from the select board. And uh, thank you for considering this proposal. Uh, I just want to add a few things. I think that the emergency declaration does put us in a sense of urgency and in thinking in emergency mode, just like what we're doing with the, with the pandemic. Uh, we need to be looking at new information all the time. And um, although the science is very clear what's happening with CO2 and temperature rise, what scientists can't predict with any certainty is what the impacts of that will be on the planet because we've never been on a planet this warm and, and the planet has never warmed this quickly in all of the geological history. And um, we're already seeing that play out. You know, the IPCC report outlined a lot of scenarios. Scientists went and measured some of them, like the melting of the permafrost, and found that it's melting at a rate they weren't expecting until 2070. It's 50 years ahead of schedule. Uh, most people have no idea how serious it actually is. Greta Thunberg described her experience reading about the climate crisis, and she convinced herself that what scientists were saying couldn't possibly be true. Because her reasoning was that if it were true, then this would be all that we would be talking about. And then it would be in the headlines every day. You know, just like with COVID, we'd have updates all the time. New information is, te what is, is telling us um, what's happening. So she convinced herself that it couldn't be true. And I've had the same exact experience uh, in reaction with friends and family and colleagues. There's a psychological phenomenon that's going on where we're in kind of a collective, a state of collective denial. I don't think that anyone here, or at least the, the select board is from the, the tone that you've taken with this proposal and, and others tonight. But uh, I think the general public is in a state of denial. And, I, and I'd like to draw an analogy. If we were all in a room together right now and an alarm went off, we might look at each other, but if nobody got up to go to the door, we would kind of look at each other for a while uncomfortably and then we probably conclude that it's not a real threat and there, we're not in any imminent danger. But if somebody stood up and said, you know, this is an emergency and we're, there's a risk here and we need to leave right now, everybody would get up and mobilize and head for the door. So I think that's, that's exactly what we need to do you know, in our town for our citizens in a, in a somewhat official capacity to confront this emergency. We need to sound the alarm and our leaders need to acknowledge the truth that this is an existential threat to civilization and that we don't have the situation under control. So that's, that's what I have to say tonight on this issue. Thank you. Can't go through a whole meeting without doing that. Mr. Hazleton. All right, Mr. Hazelton, if you could just say your name for the record. Hi, my name is Andrew Hazelton, and I'm in Precinct 5 in East Arlington. And uh, I, I don't have a lot to add to what Park and John have said, but uh, I just want to say that I'm, I'm an architect who works on uh, public schools and commercial buildings, and uh, I'm just cognizant of what uh, an enormous lift it's going to be to decarbonize infrastructure. And uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm currently involved with a public school building in Massachusetts where we're spending, in, in spite of the de design team efforts to convince the client not to do this, we're spending $7 million putting in fossil fuel infrastructure in a public school. And that's probably not even going to be legal in two years. And it's, it's, it's just a a shame, and uh, I guess my perspective on the declaration of emergency is that it, it it could be really helpful. I mean, from the perspective of somebody that's in the trenches, it's so discouraging when we're pushing for sustainable design in uh, buildings, be they public or private buildings, and uh, there's no reinforcement from uh, leaders, whether at, at the uh, 
state or the local level because the the client's impacts the client's tendency invariably is just to treat sustainability as one of many conflicting objectives in their project. So I'm, I just want to say that I think that having uh, strong leadership from the town, which I know we have, but uh, 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 it, 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 it just can't be strong enough, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's all. Mr. Beach. Beach, you can say your name for the record. My name is Philip Beach. I live on Park Street in Arlington. Uh, I've, I've really been very pleased by what all the people on the board have spoken about, all the actions that the town is doing. It, it, this is great. This declaration, as Mr. Dunn really pointed out, the, in, to me, a lot of, of its importance is that it, it gives town officials the mandate to speak now, to speak to the citizens, who may be feeling sort of helpless about what they can do individually, but also to speak to people outside of the town, to state officials, and government officials, federal officials. We've seen this last four years, the dangers of what happens when our high leaders just aren't telling the truth. And I think Arlington, Arlington can be such a leader in that. So right. I really appreciate the power that this declaration can carry in the town and outside the town. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Gina S. Gina, if you can just say your name. Yes. I, I'm, my name is Gina Saunder and I live on Kimball Road in Arlington. And I just want to build on all that was already said so well and uh um we we are one of those people in that room with the alarm going off that's standing up and and moving out and being a leader in in declaring this crisis and the hope here is that as mr dunn said we're going to influence people beyond the town. this is one of many towns to declare an emergency, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, perhaps this will move our governor to finally pass that bill that's been sitting on his desk and move the whole country to declare emergency and, and speed up um, action to mitigate uh, the climate crisis. Thank you. And one more speaker, Ms. Malopchik. Ms. Malofchik, you can say your name for record. Hello, Beth Malofchik, Russell Street. Thank you very much. Thank you, Park, and your colleagues for bringing this uh, comprehensive resolution forward. I fully support it. I'm heartened to see the support and the insights from the board. And you have given me the confidence to submit a substitute motion for my tree canopy resolution, which I think is a complementary component to what you are doing. And I hope that the uh, board members, those who are town meeting members will uh, agree um, when it comes before town meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you for all of your effort and to Gina as well and everyone who worked on it. Great. And with that, that closes the public comments portion. And so attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve. And just, just so I'm clear, Mr. Chair, um, these folks had a, a draft resolution. I'm, I'm taking that draft resolution and I'm, I'm working with that, correct? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. All right, and that wraps up 
all our articles from the last meeting, which by my calculation had us ending up around 145. So I think we made the right choice. All right, that brings us to Article 6 Bylaw Amendment, Community Preservation Act Committee Member Term Limits. Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this idea was brought to the attention of both myself and town council by the current leadership of the Community Preservation Act Committee, uh, sometimes toward the end of last calendar year, uh, with the reality that um, a good portion of the four publicly appointed members um, are, are starting to move towards uh, the end of their term limits. Uh, and concern being that the, that committee has built up good institutional knowledge, skill, and ability to manage uh, both the funds and the process and oversee the projects uh, that the Community Preservation Act um, has done so well to, to fund and oversee over the past couple of years. Uh, so I, I thought in discussion with the leadership of the community, um, again, of the CPA committee and with town council that uh, this still is an outlier in Arlington's boards, committees, and commissions. Um, I, I might be wrong and town council can correct me. I'm not sure if there's any um, bylaw term limits. I know the Council on Aging imposed term limits upon themselves uh, to enforce turnover, but I think it's the only bylaw required term limits are, are, are for the CPA. So th the form of this change, I am certainly subject to the board's feedback, uh, you know, open, excuse me, to the board's feedback and input, but I do think it's, a, it's worthy to consider uh, either extending or eliminating these term limits so that we can maintain uh, the institutional knowledge and the good folks that have given a lot of time over the years to this committee. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'm happy to support it. Um, I guess I'll move approval um, and I don't think I have any other comments. All right, thank you. Ms. Mahan? Um, I would Second, uh, Mr. Dunn's motion, and um, this isn't binding in perpetuity if for some reason years down the road, a future select board and or the town manager, whether he or she um, wanted to make some sort of change to this, they could. So, um, but I, I'm, I definitely want to second Mr. Dunn's motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, man, this is a... Uh... I, I have to um, consider this in the context of some other activities we that I'm involved in in, in the region. And, uh, and so, so, uh, so uh, I, uh, I just have some questions that may help me to kind of gauge things overall. Um, so uh, for, um, this is the first time that these, um, these uh, public members are going to uh, be term limited. I mean, this is the first, batch or cohort that are reaching the, the term limits? I believe so. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. Just, just based on the still relative newness of the existence of the committee where we're just coming up on this for the first time. Right, 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 right. So do we have the sense that there is no one um, wanting to fill these positions? Should they be limited out? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have that sense. I mean, there's a vacancy right now that we're posting for. Um, right. I don't. I may have seen applications. I don't believe I've seen any applications, but I don't want that to color okay. that question. But this, this no, I, I think we always, um, across all boards, committees, and commissions, are always really fortunate with the people that apply. Um, there's right. a lot of folks in town who step up to serve in so many different capacities. Gotcha. Um, so I, I would say I certainly don't bring this forward as any suggestion that there aren't good people who can serve. Gotcha. I bring it forward as a suggestion that good people who want to serve don't necessarily need to be asked to leave. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you, I hear you. Um, uh, and, and so um, is there, so let's say you did have to bring in new members to determine them out. It, uh, has there been any development of an onboarding process for potential new members? I would have to defer that to the leadership of the committee. Okay, all right, fine, fine. And one thing that that uh, TAC does, being uh, and I'm not sure, I don't think TAC has term limits, but what we do have is uh, we have like non-voting 
members, uh, which I think is kind of good because these are people who are interested and they, they get to participate in the meetings. They have a seat at the table. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, everyone in town has a seat at the table, but, but they get to ask questions before the other people. Uh, and I think it's a good way for people who are interested me to get up to speed me so that when a vacancy occurs, me then, then they're essentially at the top of the queue should they choose to, to um, apply because they have the, the experience. So it's just something that I think maybe we could consider. Uh, I mean, I think, I think this is gonna go through. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna support it, me, but I'm just asking some questions because it's helping me process me some other decisions that I'm gonna have to make. Uh, and so, um, let's see. Um, Oh, so what might be the alternative to, um, to voting someone off? Are you, are you asking about the removal procedure? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I've, um, I, I know I, I talked to at least one board member about that today. I, I, I'm not wedded to that. That was put forth as uh, a potential compromise for not, uh, you know, as, as in, in lieu of term limits, having there be a removal procedure there it would be the first removal procedure for any committee there isn't anything codified right now right for removal of folks from boards committees or commissions yeah um, i think I, I would defer to council if he's given any thought to if, if that did if that was included in any recommended vote how we might actually envision that yeah uh -huh. i mean i think it's something to ponder because i mean sometimes you get the members who are you know, just you know, by by their nature, obstructionist. You know, I mean, it's kind of nice to have I me mean, a way, you know, to to um, cleanse uh, the the. We'll just just deal with it. Uh, and so, another potential um, solution to this would be to expand the limit of the the um, the term. I know that would require uh, a, a change to the bylaw for uh, that committee. But but was there any thought about that? Uh, I you did, frankly we did not discuss that. Okay, all right, that's all. So thanks for entertaining those questions. I appreciate it. Mr. Corsi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I support the motion. I actually have a couple of comments. Um, I, I can remember this vote at town meeting that, that this language was added by substitute motion, and I think there was a concern at the time we were just enacting the Community Preservation Act, and there was uncertainty as to how the funds were going to be allocated and what the reporting was going to be like. Uh, over time, both to the select board, the finance committee and the town meeting. And I think what we've seen is it's been a very successful program. It's been a program that the, um, it has been open and transparent and, and um, it has, it has been very effective. So I, I support this. I'm, I'm not crazy about this type of um, putting, putting a term limit, particularly where we don't have it for any other committee in town. Um, the other thing, and I'm gonna offer this as a motion uh, that, town manager um, said that this was a compromise uh, about the removal. I, I, that removal language actually concerns me because someone gets appointed for three years and they're, they're worried about, okay, have I voted a certain way that I may somehow antagonize the appointing authority and be removed by a majority? I think you make your appointment, you live with it for three years, and if it doesn't work out, then you reconsider after three years. Bear in mind, this is only four members out of nine. It's not a majority of the uh, CPA committee. The other five members that have their own appointing authorities have no term limits. So I, I just think um, I, I support what the manager wants to do here. And I'd like to offer as amendment taking out the, the, um, uh, the compromise language so, so that the, um, it would read as is, but with the removal of the uh, term limit. Mr. Dunn, do you wanna amend your motion? Um, sure. Okay. All right, and Mrs. Mahan, did, did I go to you already? Right. Yep. Yes, you did, thank you. All right, yeah, and I'll also support this. I think, you know, there's been some discussion about term limits in general in our, in our committees in town. And I think a lot of our committees operate well with the institutional knowledge of the members that have been there for a long, long time. And this committee is relatively new. I think we have a lot of community committees that have had members that have served on that specific committee for much longer than uh, 
in the six years that this has been in existence. And I think that compared in that in conjunction with fresh ideas from new committee members creates really great work out of these committees. And I would just say, you know, our select board agendas are packed, you know, week after week, not specifically with CPA reappointments, but with reappointments. So there are certainly turnover in town boards and opportunities for, for residents to get involved. But so I think I'll, I, so I will vote in approval of this article. With that, this is a public meeting. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I know one thing before you open it for the. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's hard on Zoom to figure out when to interject something. Sure. I just want to note for folks, just so there's a general understanding, it's not that it's not possible to uh, remove somebody from a committee or a commission. It's that we don't have any other provision that allows for doing that without cause. So you'd be building it into the bylaw. That being said, I well understand uh, that the amended motion is to remove this specific piece of it. I just wanted to clarify, mostly for the public, that just because somebody's on a committee, they can't, you know, uh, be a holy terror for, you know, three years and do whatever they want. There are ways that people can be removed from committees. This is basically a, me a mechanism to remove somebody without cause. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we have one public commentator, the chair of our CPAC committee, Mr. Helmuth. We know a few. And Mr. Helmuth, you can just say your name for the record. Hi, uh, Eric Helmuth. I'm a resident of Precinct 12, and I'm the chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I just want to preface by saying that my views that I'm about to state are my own and my own only. They do not represent uh, the CPA committee. We have not taken a vote on this matter. Uh, and further, they, they do not um, reflect my views on the tenure of any current member of the committee, including myself. So as Mr. DeCourcy uh, correctly noted, this limit was instituted uh, at, at, by, on the floor of town meeting. And I think that it was you know, some reasonable caution for a brand new body, for a brand new program. We didn't really know how CPA was gonna work. We didn't really know what the priority, funding priorities were, were gonna be. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that that was something that town meeting felt obviously felt comfortable doing. Uh, six years later, or nearly six years later, now we know. You know, the, 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 we have a, a good sense. Uh, and you know, I know I'm self interested interested in saying this, but uh, you know, the committee has funded projects as equitably as we can across the whole town, um, and across the areas of CPA. We've collaborated closely with the capital budget and in done that partnership as, as best we can. We've received unanimous votes of support from the Finance Committee, Select Board, and Capital Planning Committee every year of our funding and very strong votes from town meeting. So I think there's a lot of confidence now. And in my personal view, I, I, you know, I think that um, we, I, I don't see as much cause for being the outlier, being the only committee that, um, that has, a, has a limit on, on uh, how long you can serve continuously. Um, and I think the reason that um, this, this can be an issue is the same reason for any other committee that deals with complex tasks. The CPA law is, is a strange animal. It, is, uh, it has unusual requirements and, and restrictions, and it's a constant uh, bit of work to really figure out what we can and can't fund and explain that to, to folks. Um, and it it's, takes at least a term, at least a year and sometimes two, uh, to really come up to speed. I think to Mr. Diggins' really good point about onboarding, yeah, we do it. Um, but it's one of those things that you just have to learn by going through a cycle or two because there are so many different things that can, that can come up. Um, so I think that it would be helpful. It's helpful to have institutional memory for multi-year projects that you funded before. It helps you just understand kind of where, where you want to go. I think it has been pointed out, uh, there is natural turnover. Nevertheless, we have a vacancy now. Uh, I think that we've had at least three members who were appointed uh, in the five or six years uh, who are no longer serving. So there has been plenty of opportunity for fresh blood and that has been welcome and, and, and wonderful. There's also turnover in the five statutory representatives from home commissions um, as well. So I think there's, we do have um, shakeup um, in a good way. And finally, I, I, I wanna express appreciation for Mr. DeCourcy's good point that I hadn't fully considered. 
you know, and that is the, the independence of, of any committee, committee member to do their work uh, without undue fear of being removed without cause. And, you know, I think that it's, uh, the select board has a good vetting process and the town manager for appointing members. Uh, I've been uh, pleased to be invited to participate in that project process for new members. And I think the due diligence happens up front like it does in the other committee and, and, and is effective. And, you know, I think that uh, I can say as, as chair of this body for a number of years, that the select board is a, is a good partner in consulting with us and giving us advice, but they have never told us what to do. And that's really important in a position of, of public trust. So uh, I think that you know, making us the same as other committees would preserve that independence in a good way. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And we have Beth Malofchuk. Ms. Malofchuk, if you can just say your name for the record. Beth Malofchuk, uh, Russell Street. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I would uh, like to see an audit of all of the projects that have been funded to date um, before uh, consideration was made of changing the rules by which town meeting approved this committee. Um, uh, Mr. Helmuth very kindly um, told us uh, his perspective on that, but I think for the public, it would be nice to actually see the numbers and see uh, how the funds are dispersed among the uh, funding priorities as regulated by Community Preservation Act um, law. Um, I also think this committee um, could benefit from some diversity of um, worldview and opinion. And um, I'm just wondering if our Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion had been uh, consulted on, on um, this decision going forward. Um, as we know, um, in 2019, there was a hard won award uh, for Whittemore Park, uh, approximately half a million dollars. And um, town meeting was misled by a statement of Mr. Helmuth invoking town manager um, regarding a project that's uh, underway now. And so I find it disingenuous um, uh, to consider uh, this suggested change and um, would certainly like more information onto the work of the committee and um, I'll end my remarks there, thank you. John, you're muted. Thank you, Ms. Malachuk. And do we have any additional comments from the board? Yes. Mr. Dunn. Um, I would just like to firmly refute Ms. Bolovchek's repeated misstatement of past events. And thankfully, these are all recorded and her version of the truth does not stand up. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. So, Attorney Hyatt, uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah, just on that point, Mr. Chairman, and, and um, Mr. Dunn's right on the, on the Whittemore Park discussion. We did that. That issue came up at that hearing, and there was a change of circumstances as to the removal of trees. But I would invite people, and we can perhaps get the the date the date of the hearing that came up. We discussed it. The circumstances were discussed. The, the, I, I, we weren't misled. Thank you. And with that, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion to approve. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. And that brings us to Article 15, Bylaw Amendment Domestic Partnerships. And Mr. Chapdelaine, do we know who is presenting on this article? If I could confirm with uh, Attorney Heim, uh, is Attorney Cunningham taking the lead or are we promoting Guillermo Hamlin? So I believe Mr. Hamlin is, is the um, uh, original uh, uh, proponent of the article who proposed this to the Rainbow Commission. To my understanding, he's prepared to speak on it. Mr. Cunningham, uh, uh, Deputy Town Council Cunningham, 
uh, worked uh, extensively with uh, the Rainbow Commission and Mr. Hamlin on the preparation of this article and the research that went into the memo. All right, and we can promote Mr. Hamlin. Mr. Hamlin, if you could just say your name for the record, then just Hello. Tell us about the article. Hello, uh, my name is Guillermo Hamlin. I am a Precinct 14 town meeting member. And as uh, Doug Heim said, I'm the initial petitioner for the domestic partnership article. Um, some background, as a result of joining town meeting, I wanted to see what I can contribute to the town bylaw that was unique and in my opinion needed to provide some material good to the residents of Arlington. As a result, I was studying the most recent efforts from the city of Cambridge, Boston, and the city of Somerville regarding domestic partnerships. I would learned in the history of the town of Arlington that there has never been a domestic partnership article on the books. After uh, consultation and some outreach to uh, the town council, both Doug Heim and uh, later down the way, Michael Cunningham, we've begun doing the work to draft the language of a standard domestic partnership bylaw amendment. Along the way, after researching more about the domestic partnership aspect, in particular, the differences between a city ordinance and a uh, town article, the enforcement from the municipal law enforcement unit, as opposed to just cities being able to just issue an ordinance and uh, lead accordingly, it made me uh, appreciate reaching out to the town council and not really rushing this out um, as much as I may have wanted to. We took the time to really see other towns such as Provincetown uh, to really get some inspiration on this article language. So I decided to get the 10 signatures, but prior to submitting it to the town clerk and select board, we presented it to the Rainbow Commission. And after a brief presentation with the assistance of town council, they decided to adopt it. And the reason being, I believe, is that it is a human rights issue. It is something that can be materially beneficial to those who are in committed relationships, but for whatever reason are not choosing marriage. Uh, one unique aspect about this domestic partnership bylaw is that closer to the submission, the question began to rise, what to do about reciprocity? I'm in no position to lead on what the town or you, the select board, can vote in terms of moving this forward because the language as it stands now is for those of two consenting adults. In the city of Somerville, they have waived that need. I believe that they made it two or more and made it an enterprise of consenting adults. Working with Michael Cunningham and Doug Heim, I asked if whether or not this could be viable or whether it was the case that it is within the scope of the, the domestic partnership bylaw. Um, Mike Cunningham was very kind and helpful to look it over and was able to provide some additives in language that could potentially effectuate it. But we decided to proceed with the standard domestic partnership bylaw tonight for your approval and review and submission. Because we believe that in terms of its precedent, it holds up. It holds up prior to any gay marriage ruling. It's been in the state for some time. I can refer to the town council on the specifics. But in terms of precedent, we have plenty to work with here. The only area that I seek guidance is whether or not to allow for language that can affirm, protect, and anticipate any reciprocal needs from say residents of Somerville who intend to move to the town of Arlington and then may find their domestic partnership to be dissolved automatically just by moving. I ask that the select board consider the language that was submitted to consider how to define the parameters. I'm not necessarily asking the select board to decide that tonight, but if possible, maybe ask, offer some advice on ways that we could offer to town meeting. So specifically, I'm asking for a vote to proceed with the domestic partnership bylaw with some guidance on whether or not we should anticipate two or more domestic partners in anticipation of reciprocal needs 
from abutting cities, in particular, the city of Somerville. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Mr. Diggins. Um, well, as a member of the, uh, of, as a liaison from the select board to the Rainbow um, Commission, and I uh, was happy to see Mr. Guillermo um, present on this. I mean, uh, uh, I am, um, uh, I could say so much, it, uh, um, but um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get impassioned about this because I really want a, the board to vote, you know, in the way that it feels is best. It, uh, I know sometimes I can get a little animated uh, and, and I just, I don't want to push it. Uh, I, just, I, I just, I'm going to pass for now and, and then let other people speak. I may come back to it, hey, but I'm clearly in favor of this. Hey, and I understand um, uh, Mr. Guillermo's concerns about uh, the speed at which we move. Um, with this, he brings up a very good point uh, regarding being reciprocity, and uh, uh, and, and so uh, I've always been uh, more of an incrementalist, but, uh, and so uh, I I think if we just do the domestic partnerships, it'd be a big step forward. And, but if we think we can go further, I think it'd be uh, a very good thing. Thank you, Mrs. Mohammed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I'm going to take a sip of water in a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a few, um, I guess, legal questions um, through, either to the chair or through the chair um, to town council, council or deputy town council, um, only because I'm just, I can go toe to toe with you on med mal medical malpractice stuff, but in terms of um, domestic partnerships and uh, mass state law. I am really lacking in that. So um, could I get sort of a brief explanation of uh, what is allowed by uh, Mass State Law regarding um, domestic partnerships? Uh, and, and my question is, is it Mass State Law uh, outlined something that a, a municipality, city or town can avail themselves as an opportunity to enforce this law or are they rights that Mass State Law outlines are guaranteed to every municipality and citizens in those cities and towns, if I've asked the question appropriately? Attorney Heim or Attorney Cunningham? Mr. Chair, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cunningham. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Um, there is no statute at the state level on this issue, but we know that other cities and towns have domestic partnership bylaws and They've been on the books for some time. You have communities like Boston, Cambridge, Brookline, Nantucket, Provincetown, Truro, all have the domestic partnership bylaws that have passed through the attorney general's office and those have been active for some time. So I think in terms of a legal ground, if Arlington were to enact a domestic partnership bylaw um, that would involve two persons, I think that's on firm legal ground. Uh, the, the question raised by Mr. Hamlin is, and I think is a, is a good one is whether the more than two persons for a domestic partnership would stand up uh, to scrutiny at the attorney general level. And that is less certain. That has not, that has not uh, reached a conclusion. There is no judicial or statutory guidance for us at this point on that issue. And I guess is um, through the chair as a follow-up to that is um, some of the language that I've seen is that more in article 15, um, that asks for recognition of domestic partnerships as allowed by um, the Commonwealth of Mass. Um, and, and, and that's where the crux of my question is, where it says as allowed by the Commonwealth of Mass. What does that mean? Is there something that's already afforded to everybody? Or is there something through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that if you choose to adopt this, it's going to pass the test of uh, the Attorney General or um, so, Mike, before uh, you chime in, I've added on the chat a link to the state site regarding a compilation of laws, cases, web sources on the legal issues affecting unmarried couples, whether it's for the um, it's for the purposes of that. And I don't know the, the legal case, but I do know that the state site cites the city of Somerville's ordinance granting 
uh, polyamorous groups certain rights. So I can't speak to the legality or the attorney general. All I know is that they seem to display it on the site as something that's notable. But again, I can't speak to anything beyond that, into which case I defer to town council for the rest. Attorney Cunningham. And Ms. Mahan, I, yes, thank you, Ms. Ms. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd say on the issue with the state's approval, that's what we're, we're looking at the precedential value of other communities that have gone through this process. And the fact that they have gone through it, it's been subject to attorney general scrutiny and that is, it's been permitted, gives us the guidance we need to be, to be comfortable with an assurance that it will be permitted by the state. Uh, that we have no such assurance for domestic partnerships of more than two persons at this time, but that's okay. that. That thank you. That that clears it, clears it up for me. Um, I first I'd like to uh, move approval of the proposed warrant article. Um, and in terms of, uh, and I don't mean to say this in a negative way. I take the same stance when I've had conversation about Arlington's MBTA assessment, which is ridiculously unfair. We pay two hundred thousand. Quincy pays 800,000 and myself and my colleagues have been working on that to change it. And people have said to me, well, you know, Quincy only pays 800,000 and you're gonna hurt Quincy if you push this because then they'll have to pay their fair share. And what I've always said is, well, I'm, I'm not here working for the, the city of Quincy. I'm here for the town of Arlington. So in terms of um, if people move here from some of them and under their ordinances because they don't have bylaws because they're a city and we have bylaws because we're a town we'll cross that bridge when we get to it my thing is i'd like to um in moving approval on this um and i'd certainly be guided by my colleagues is i'd like to start taking the steps that we're going down the road and as we get further on down the road if we do have to and i don't mean that sarcastically at all i'm just trying to um um you know little fish and a medium-sized spy pond. So um, I'd like to move approval um, just under what uh, Mr. Hamlin, Attorney Cunningham, and uh, Attorney Heim have outlined. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll second Mrs. Mahan's motion. Um, I just have uh, I have a couple thoughts to add. One is that. Uh, I have more than a passing knowledge of Quebec family law, uh, having recently been married in Quebec. And uh, one of the things that's kind of, that came out of my understanding of that is the domestic partnership law in Quebec is actually has ended up, like they passed it before marriage was legal so that they could extend rights to people who weren't, it wasn't available to. But that set of laws actually languished and it's actually behind at this point. It's like not as it's not a desirable thing to enter into in general because um, the, the because of some anachronisms, you know. And I say anachronism relating back to like 2011 or something like that. Uh, you know, is it 2011? No, sorry, to like, uh, 2001. Sorry. Um, and so I guess there's a little bit of a risk here. I think that we're going to create something that we're going to look at in a few years and be like, wow, you know could have moved, you know, we created something that's actually a little bit stuck. But uh, the good news is it's not permanent and we'll be able to improve it if we do that. Uh, the second thought is, um, is that I actually, I am a strong supporter of uh, non-traditional families. You know, I think that people want to build families that they, that, uh, are, you know, don't follow what has been the traditional, and I'm going to use the word heteronormative man and woman relationship. And I'm comfortable with there with there being more. And so, in, if there is appetite on the board, I would be delighted to join a move uh, to make this available to three or uh, to three people. Um, but uh, that said, I'm not. Um, I'm also happy to support it as written it, it more narrowly. But if we can count, if we can count to three on the three, I'm there. Mrs. Acorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'll, I'll support Mrs. Mahan's motion. And um, and I think you know, to Mr. Dunn's earlier points, I, I this um, draft or, or pr proposed bylaw, I, I, would, I would imagine most of the domestic partnership 
bylaws that you saw across the state were enacted prior to 2003, prior to the to the Goodrich decision. I think so. What what you were mentioning, Mr. Dunn in Quebec, it, it, this was probably pre 2003 language that we um, had in, in in a number of the different communities. So I don't know if there's it, it, any other language that um, you know with the passage of time should be should be changed. But I think for tonight's purposes, I, I support what's presented to us and what Mrs. Mahan uh, moved. All right, thank you. Mr. Diggins, did any additional thoughts come to fruition? Well, I mean, I certainly have the appetite for three because eh, I kind of hit it at this in the first uh, meeting uh, with my first um, time uh, on the board after the election eh, is that um, it was um, actually in Somerville be that uh, I lived in a relationship you know, and it was with a, a married couple. And my link to Arlington actually was that the graduate student uh, who came to the lab, uh, he and his wife actually lived on Park Ave. Me. So my first time coming to Somerville was to come to, to their place. Me. And uh, it, was, um, it, was, it was just such a wonderful, Wonderful relationship, and and it's interestingly, I me mean, and I often say that uh, Arlington um, has always welcomed me. I mean, we would stop at Via Lago, I mean, and get some fresh pasta, and then swing by D'Agostino's, I mean, and pick up some food, and then head to Park Street. And, and this was back in the um, the late eighties, you know, and and uh, there was just no problems with anyone in Arlington at any time, and, and so so um, I, I I um I see the value. Mean in allowing for I mean different kinds of family structures, uh, but at the same time, I mean uh, I don't want to make this too much for um, town meeting to swallow because I think it really would be good I mean, for us to get to domestic partnerships. And I think partly domestic partnerships have have maybe languished because of of gay marriage, I mean, uh, but there are lots of reasons for why people don't necessarily want to get married and they want to have the protections that you get from domestic partnership. If nothing else, I mean, to have the ability to, to um, take care of kids uh, in an equal way and, and visitation rights for um, when a uh, hospitalization is a, a factor. I mean, and so um, a, my inclination would be to, uh, I, I guess I prefer to send up something small to, um, to town meeting and have them amended into something larger than to have them recoil, I mean, as something huge. I mean, uh, but but um, as Mr. Dunn said, if we get to three, on here, I mean, I'll, I'll be the second one. If we get to three, it, um, that'll be great, but there will be no offense at all to anyone if we stay at two, I mean, and so that's it, thank you. Yeah, and I'll thank you, Mr. Hamlin, for bringing this to our attention and putting together the article with the Rainbow Co Commission. I'll support Ms. Mahan's motion as well. Um, you know, I think this is an important step and you know, I'm certainly open to further discussions or if any board members want to open those discussions, happy to do so as well. But as moved, I'll certainly support that motion. Do you have any additional comments from the board? With that, we have a motion to approve by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Han. Oh, sorry. This is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak, use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now. Going once, going twice. We have one, oh, we have a few raised hands here. Mr. Rubinson. Okay. Right. Mr. Rubinson, if you can say your name for the record. Hi, yes, uh, this is Andy Rubinson. Uh, Tanager Street in the Heights. Uh, I am the co-chair of the Rainbow Commission. I just wanted to um, to mention that the fact when you when you talk about passing things, you know, incrementally. Uh, I think back to the Equality Act, which recently uh, passed through the House, and the, this idea that okay, we're going to not discriminate against um, gay and lesbians, but we're gonna hold back on transgender because giving transgender people rights is 
is more than people can handle. And it created quite uh, a stir um, when it happened because people left, uh, were, were uh, left feeling left behind. So I just want the, the suck board to consider the fact by saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll go with the two versus three or more um, to, to uh, Len's point, they, you know, the, the uh, people that if they're caregivers in the school, they, they, this impacts people's relationships. And I, and I know things feel safer maybe, but I, I just wanna consider that when you're leaving people out and, and making them other, then it, uh, it, it may not have the, the impact that you are searching for in making Arlington a welcoming town. Thank you. Thank you. We have Laura Kiesel. All right, Ms. Kiesel, if you can just say your name for the record. Yeah, my name is Laura Kiesel. Um, I support this measure. I agree also with um, what Andy Rubinson just said as well. Um, I wanted to point out that marriage equality is still something that is not available to many disabled people because of health insurance reasons. Uh, Medicaid and medical divorce is a, very much a reality and it's become more of a reality due to COVID-19. Um, I also have a potential question uh, because I know the Somerville domestic partnership rule in addition to allowing two or more, the other new language that it had that was kind of innovative was that you didn't necessarily have to live with that partner to have a domestic partnership. And I think that that was introduced in part because the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, people were having problems getting like clearance to see or spend time or, or spend time at other people's homes that were their partners um, because they didn't technically share a residence. So I would be wondering if that language is in this as well to consider people who may not live together as domestic partners. Um, because if not, I would support that to also be considered, especially again, given the pandemic um, and allowing people access to their chosen family. Thank you. Attorney Cunningham, do you have any response or Mr. Hamlin? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd say in the language in the proposed bylaw in, in front of the board does require uh, cohabitation that the domestic partners reside together. That would, as Ms. Kiesel points out, that is another distinguishing element uh, from what Somerville has done. But again, that would be something that's not consistent with uh, other cities and towns that have done domestic partnership bylaws. I don't know. Uh, it may be something that the Attorney General would, would approve. It may not be. It's just we don't have any guidance on that issue at this time. Thank you. And I was I back um, what Mike Cunningham said, this measure as it's written does not allow for that. I would say if it's something anyone's interested in to please add any friendly amendments based on the approval tonight. All right. And that is all the public commentators. Do we have any additional comments, questions from the board? With that, Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Hamlin. That brings us to Article 18, Vote Appropriation School Committee Member Stipends with uh, Krista Kelleher. Right. And Ms. Kelleher, if you can just say your name for the record, tell us a little bit about the article. Sure. Again. <laughs> Again, uh, this is I'm Krista Kelleher, and I am at 153 Medford Street, Precinct 5. Thank you so much for your consideration of this article and for your support of it last year when it was first filed. Just for a bit of background in my professional work, I conduct um, applied research to ensure equity in electoral leadership at all levels of government. Promoting gender and racial equity in public leadership requires the removal of institutional barriers to both seeking and serving in office. When I filed this article for consideration last year and collaborated with Jennifer Seuss on it, I wanted to ensure that first, 
all of Arlington's public servants are valued and that the concept of equity is implemented through town policies and practices. And then second, access to key leadership, leadership positions for all those interested um, is strengthened. So I'm gonna offer a really brief rationale for why even a minimal stipend offered to school committee members makes for good policy. School committee members deserve value and respect for the key leadership role they step into once elected. They provide a vital public service and during both pandemic and non-pandemic times, they take on a range of responsibilities such as the school budget. Historically, school committees have had more women serving on them relative to local governing bodies such as city councils and select boards bodies that are frankly more likely to offer stipends. We also know that according to data being collected by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, cities are far more likely than towns to provide compensation for these decision makers. Here in Arlington, service on the select board, as you know, offers a $3,000 stipend for each member with 3,500 as chair for chair. Several other elected public service positions are afforded compensation, such as the three member board of assessors that offers 4,900 to those serving on it. And um, other appointed positions come um, with compensation, such as the retirement board at 4,500 per member. Arlington should lead on this issue and acknowledge that the existing disparity between its two main policy making bodies, the select board and the school committee um, that needs to be remedied. So this disparity needs to be remedied. This is a matter of equity. Finally, opportunities to serve should be open to all, including those for whom even a relatively small stipend may be important. Individuals with limited incomes or non-traditional work hours, single parents, persons caring for uh, special needs children, young children or elders, may, it may make a difference um, to have um, a stipend as they consider running for office. A stipend might also make it more likely that individuals with perspectives currently underrepresented, such as persons of color and new Americans will step up to run and bring to the table important voices and experiences. So while I know it's minimal by, by most measures, um, a $3,000 stipend might help cover childcare costs associated with meeting participation or balance out paid work time due to school committee obligations. Uh, just so you know, there's really limited data on school committee compensation in other Massachusetts communities um, um, because the Mass Association of School Committees uh, tries to collect data, but it's self-reported and so it's um, voluntary. So it's hard to confirm stipend averages or even the actual number of towns that offer stipends. We do know that for town manager 12 communities, three of them offer stipends and nine do not. The background memo submitted by Jennifer Seuss and me provides some more data points and more information. So I recognize that a feasible funding source needs to be identified, but offering stipends will remedy a longstanding inequity. As a community that values um, an inclusive and welcoming town government governance system and engaged civic leaders, we need to take many steps to realize respect, equity, and access for all. Affording some level of compensation to school committee members is one of these steps. Thank you so much for considering this article yet again. Thank you. All right, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'll move approval. Um, and I want to thank Ms. Kelleher for the presentation. It was, uh, you convinced me a year ago and I'm, I'm convinced again, I know how hard the school committee members um, work. Just one question I have for attorney Heim, where this does acquire, require an appropriation, who, whose recommendation would be before town meeting uh, on this article? Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I understand that it re it's a little bit of a funky, um, um, article was last year, it remains this year. The law requires a, a simple vote to set what the level of compensation is. It's not actually an appropriation article. Obviously, if you're going to uh, approve it and set it for this coming fiscal year, there needs to be some money to back it up. But this is the, the main motion here is, is, is the select boards 
the uh, you know some sort of budgetary uh, uh, article to figure out how it's going to be funded would have to be either figured out uh, later or uh, in some sort of adjustment to you know the appropriate budget. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. I'm definitely very happy to support it, um, and I do think that it's appropriate that, that, like the the school committee, you know, for the finance committee, when back in the day, I remember we actually took we gave ourselves a pay cut during one of the budget crunches. We went from $100 per member down to $50 per member because we were trying to figure out our way to contribute. And I think that that is one of the things that makes it really politically difficult for the school committees because. You know, they have these very difficult decisions where, you know, parents stand in front of them and say, hey, uh, you know, you're cutting this teacher's aid or and it's so, so important to me. And, you know, the things, the list of things that the school committee has to cut is, you know, they, it's, it's a hard list that they choose from. And, uh, you know, giving up their own stipend is the, one of the things that has that, that goes. Um, and so all that said, I understand why it, it hasn't been true, but at the same time, I absolutely support them, uh, you know, getting some sort of stipend. And I'll also say that for me, like the select board stipend was often, you know, I get a lot of, uh, you know, we, you, you show up at enough meetings and people start hitting you up as a fundraising source. And I said, you know, I've often treated this stipend as my fundraiser, my Arlington fundraiser uh, kitty. So um I guess those, I, I, I'm probably more words than were necessary, but I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Diggins? Yes, I'm very happy to support it too, and, uh, but I, I do have uh, some questions. Uh, uh, first, Kristen, uh, can you give me a sense of how many hours uh, a person you know, on, on the school committee works? I mean, I know they have the school committee main meetings, but then they have these subcommittee meetings also, right? So mm -hmm. approximately how many hours a month do you think? I think it really, Thanks for the question, sure. Select, um, Selectman Diggins. I think it really depends on this, uh, what cycle, what part of the year you're in, what year it um, might be, um, contract negotiations, what subcommittees you serve on. We were, I was thinking of doing a survey of former school committee members and maybe even present ones to figure that out. But I don't, I, I do know that we have a former select uh, school committee uh, person here to talk a little bit about hours put in. But I think it varies very much. Okay. You know, my, my, I ask because my sense is that I mean, they they put in uh, more hours than than we do on the select board. I mean, so so that's what I was driving at, Ms. Kelleher. And um, the second um, um, question is, I, mean, I saw uh, that you had provided me some data. I think Jennifer, Ms. Susan has provided the data on, on various school committees I mean, and the payment for them. It's quite a few. You know, and I was wondering, do you have a sense of the um, ethnic makeup of these committees, you know, uh, and, and kind of a corollary to that question is, do we have a sense of maybe how stipend may correlate with increased ethnic diversity in committees? Selectman Diggins, it's an excellent question. Uh, I don't think, I think there's limited data, but I do know that there are folks collecting data on this in the state. So, I'd, I'd um, love to see that. If you have time to look for it, that'd be great. If, if you don't, let me know and I'll poke around for it because I'm just kind of intrigued me by, by the, um, the question. Uh, and, it's an important um, question. Yeah. And so, so um, a part of me, and, um, I, I'll, I'll say this we, uh, to uh, Mr. Dunn's comment you know, about the school committee and having to you know, try to keep your stipend I mean, when you're doing cuts I mean, to um, things in the school. I think the solution to that would be to have it not come from the school committee budget. You know, so so the town, you know, could could you know, put that money up and and look at me. I don't have any kids, but I love kids. We, I, I think kids, we by definition are our future. I mean, and every time I hear people me complain about you know, you know, what we'll do, we'll bring in families with more kids, and then we have to educate them. For me, that's a good problem to have me and I'd love to see me Arlington me cherish that opportunity because I mean, those kids are going to be the ones that are going to get us out of the climate crisis and all other kind of crises that we've gotten ourselves into and maybe they'll help design websites I mean that can help people register for 
vaccines we mean when other websites aren't working so so uh, i'd like to see us do what we can to educate them well I mean, and that includes having that part of it means has having a good uh, school committee so i'm going to do the incremental thing again we need to say this is a good start but i'd like to see get more I mean, um, and part of me was like let's start with the the three thousand now i mean and then it um uh, I maybe next year we can put in another article be where we can maybe step that up me uh, over five years so that we get you to me six thousand be uh, and even if the second board stays the same because I really think the school committee people deserve more I mean uh, and and on top of that once we get to that point then index it be, because as you know I mean ten years out if you're still at three hundred or whatever that's going to be half of what it is when you started so. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is Mahan. Well, I get to follow Mr. Diggins. First off, Mr. Diggins, I would challenge any elected official on any board, commission, housing authority assessors to put in 50% of the amount of time that I put in. So I, I don't agree with Mr. Diggins that my colleagues on the school committee put in far more hours. Um, I'll speak for myself. And I think anybody who has lived and breathed in Arlington uh, knows how many hours I put in. So uh, I, I, I'm gonna have to totally disagree on that. That's not taking away from my colleagues on the school committee um, that perform the job that they do. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, so, so I, 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 I'm in favor of who made the motion, Mr. DeCourcy's motion, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Um, I think it should come from the school budget. Um, I understand the argument. Oh well, you know, parents are going to come in and say I wanted a teacher's aid. Speaking from personal experience, my youngest, who's well beyond the age of 22 now, but was severely disabled and had severe special needs, was denied. My husband and I paid a little over $100,000 of uh, teachers, uh, equipment, her NovaChat board that could speak for her that was denied by the schools. And I used to think, well, it's because I'm so politically active and I have been pointing out over the years, the school budget, how they always say, I, I had two different times where there was seven figures difference of what they said they didn't have and they really did have. So I think, you know, if you say the argument's going to be, oh, well, they're going to come in and say, don't, you know, if it's out of the school budget, they're going to come in and say, don't do that teacher's aid. Guess what? I couldn't get services that were vital to my youngest that affected her life now as an adult that she should have had. Um, that's not a problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of hot button on that because um, taking a positive out of my experience, other severely disabled children who go through the Arlington public school system who can't get the services and who are forced to hire um, advocates and still don't get the services under state law that they should get. And it's either if you're lucky enough, like my husband and I, that we end up paying, you know, 50,000 for this piece of equipment, 35,000 for a teacher from the cotting to augment the ridiculous uh, lab that Arlington offers. For severely disabled kids. So I feel very passionate about that. You kind of hit two buttons with me in terms of uh, myself personally, how many hours I put in. When I ran for the select board, I didn't even know you got money. I assumed it was like school committee. You did it. And I do the same thing similar to Mr. Dunn. I, 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 you know, under the law, I can use my campaign funds to maybe, you know, give money for a raffle, buy a table at 10 to help, you know, uh, I'm gonna say a club that doesn't exist, the Zoom Club of Arlington, I don't do that. I use my select board um, to do that and people are having a problem with that. So I'm certainly in favor of the school committee being compensated. I don't think it should from the, be from the town side budget, especially looking at what we're looking at in terms of 2023, 20, fiscal year 23 and how much we're running from there. But I'll start and I, you know, once they get that, um, I'm not, I would not be in favor of, of hiking them up to 6,000 a year or two after that. But who knows, I may not be on the board 
then I, I may only be able to express my opinion as a town meeting member. So I apologize, but you really pushed a couple of buttons for me there, dude. And I had to say something. So I am in favor of this. 3,000 and town meeting will determine it with finance committee and whoever else recommendation, I would say from the school budget. And I, I don't mean, I wanna to apologize to um, Ms. Kelleher and Ms. Seuss and anyone who I know have spent a lot of time working on this. If I, I don't mean any of my remarks in an untoward way or negative way in terms, because I think my colleagues on the school committee should be at least receiving as much as we are on the select board. So, and thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm also happy to support this. I was happy to support it a year ago. I'm a little nostalgic as I sit here reviewing this article because if it wasn't the last article we heard, it was very close to the last article we heard in the chamber. So, um, but I think it's very well thought out and definitely well deserved. Um, you know, we could go back and forth all day about time commitments, but it definitely, whatever it is, it is a significant time commitment. And I think um, they should be compensated for that time in the same manner that we are. With that, it is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak to this, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now. Mr. Chair, may I say something while you're uh, gathering those? Yes. Uh, two yeah. quick items that I just wanted to make sure that I sharpen my pencil on. One is uh, Mr. DeCourcy's original question about whose motion it is. I will note that the Finance Committee re did report on this article last year, and I would recommend that they report on it again, and they did approve $3,000. So I, I think it would be helpful to have uh, some motion language from uh, that's consistent from both the Select Board and the Finance Committee because it involves something with some overlap. I also just want to note for folks that one of the things that is important to remember just for future reference is that um, as long as elected part-time employees make under $5,000, they're not eligible for the pension system and therefore not eligible for health insurance. So that's been one of the things that we've considered uh, in what we set our stipends at uh, in the past. So just as, a, just as something to clarify, especially in case any members of the public were gonna comment on that score. Thank you. Thank you. And we have no public commentators. So with that, Attorney Heim. That was because of me. <laughs> you scared them off. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Mahat. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. I don't think it was you that scared them off, yes. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. I'm going to take it as, you know, Usually I'm just too long-winded, so, but I'm going to take it as a victory this time. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelleher. Thank you so much. And that closes our warrant article hearing portion. New business. Uh, Attorney Hunt. No new business. Ms. Chaplin. Uh, just one piece, Mr. Chair, and to members of the board. Um, I think as the board knows, we're no longer able to conduct first dose vaccination clinics in Arlington uh, based on limited supply of vaccines at the state level. Uh, we are, how, uh, however, starting this week to uh, provide a limited number of, doses, uh, number of doses to senior housing in coordination with the Arlington Housing Authority. We're also part of an application that has been sent in to the state to be um, to participate in a larger regional collaborative that would be led by the Cambridge Health Alliance uh, as the overseeing entity located primarily at Tufts University, which would of course be pretty proximal to Arlington. And then um, we'd, we'd be partnering with communities, Cambridge, Somerville, Everett, Revere, Winthrop, Medford, and Malden, uh, and of course, Arlington as well. So we're awaiting to hear back from the state as to whether or not they would approve that entity. But we basically we're doing everything we can to try to bring vaccination closer to Arlington uh, based on what we've witnessed, which is there are still a significant number of people who live in Arlington. And now this is happening in every community that can't get to Fenway Park, that can't get to Gillette and, and really need this to be closer to home, either getting there themselves or potentially getting there with our help through the Council on Aging. 
So I just wanted to let the board know that that effort is underway. And if we are successful in getting that approved, I'll let you know right away. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, so the only um, thing I have to uh, remind people of is that the, the town survey uh, has been extended uh, uh, till the 8th, till um, Monday. So so if you didn't take it, you still have a chance to take it. And we uh, we really ask that you take it. The more people that take it, the more uh, we have a good sense of what's going on in town. Uh, it's a good survey this year. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Now, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just um, follow up with um, the town manager, um, and I do call him Adam sometimes, but I just want people to know I mean, there's no slight, but we're at the select board meeting, so he's the town manager. Um, uh, on your new business, I just wanted to ask, because I know I had sent you, um, actually, I sent it to our Health and Human Services uh, Director, Christine Bongiorno, and I CC'd you today. Um, from State House News uh, about the fact that the governor, uh, for whatever reason, I can't figure it out, um, stopped uh, local boards of health that set, went out and spent money and, and got people in there and had clinics set up, um, did an about face on that and said, we're not gonna provide that anymore. And then because of different um, boards of health and uh, town managers and city managers, uh, got an audience with him he did another about face and what Mr. Chapelain pointed out said if you can guarantee that you're uh, at a site that's delivering at least 750 doses I think it's per day it's either per day or per week is it per day or per week Mr. Per, Chapelain? Per day six days a week. Six days a week um, and the article I had forward, forwarded to Ms. Bongiorno said that um, the way I read it, and, and I don't know if Mr. Chapelain has seen it, if you have, if you can correct me or say if it's true, that um, there was a collaboration approved, which included Malden, Medford, Winthrop, and Fluin, um, and a few other cities and towns. I didn't see Cambridge, Arlington, or Somerville in there. And I was forwarding it to say, are we doing that? So my question is, um, are we, the way I read the article out of State House News, the, the Malden, Medford, Winthrop, Everett, Methuen, and Salem, and a few other communities, they had already been approved. Are, uh, are we joining that and they have already been approved or are we um, doing what the governor has suggested, which is coming up with a collaboration of our own with Arlington, Belmont, Cambridge, the, the cities and towns you mentioned. I'm just confused, just like a lot of stuff with this vaccine. So if you could kind of clear that up. So we are attempting to do the latter. And I, you know, I did respond to your email today, but I, I also got a funny message back. So you may not have received it. Did you get my email back today? No, I'm guessing no. No, uh, I was I haven't checked my email since like 12. Yeah, no, my 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 email was funny today for us. I've been having the same days. problem. Um, but but that aside, no, what we're attempting to do the latter. Um, so there there was a group. Uh, I, you maybe are thinking of it was a Melrose, Wakefield, Medford group that sort of like yes, yes. Met, Metro North Public Health Collaborative that had been in existence. I believe they're still being allowed to continue, but we're part of another group that Medford would also be a part of that it has applied. And we're waiting okay. to hear back. Okay, that's that's what was, was confusing me. So, and I, I just want to say, you know, I'm, I know it's it's late but not as late as we have been going in the past so thank you mr chair um i i just want to applaud that the way that um the town of arlington from the manager on down has really had to just keep you know coming up to the drawing board coming up with pl plans i don't want to say on the fly because these are we have professionals that are working for us here in the town and basically play by the rules and then all of a sudden you know especially around COVID 19 you know, PPE and PPP programs and now vaccinations. And then the rules change, you know, at the drop of a dime two or three times. It's, it, it's really frustrating. Um, and I know our town manager, health and human services director, all the way down, council on aging, you know, even Arlington Rec and facilities in the high school and our school side um, are doing everything they can um, and will continue to do that. Um, so I just wanted to make sure my remarks aren't taken in a way 
that I'm dissatisfied with anything that the town's doing because you've come up with like plan six or seven now to try to play by the rules outlined and then the circumstances change. And instead of complaining and, you know, stamping your feet about it, you say, okay, rules have changed. We're going to try to set something else up. So thank you very much. And that was my whole new business was around um, the governor first saying, yes, board, boards of health, you're going to get it. No, you're not going to get it. Yes, you can get it, but you have to come up with this other way that you can deliver 750 day with a collaboration of other cities and towns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, yeah, just to elaborate briefly on what Mrs. Mahan said, thank you to the town manager and to, to uh, Mrs. Bongiorno Health and Human Services and the whole team, because I, I know for a fact there are changes and, and unforeseen circumstances that come up all the time. And I'm aware of one that came up today and then she was uh, got right to it and, and um, has, um, has, has really been amazing. Um, my doing business tonight, actually, I'm gonna move up the street to Arlington High School and it, this, this winter has been a particularly tough or tough academic year even for all the students and student athletes. And I wanna recognize two of the winter sports teams. They just finished their seasons um, and the Arlington High girls hockey team won their third Middlesex League title in a row. And um, special recognition because I've got two former basketball players in the, uh, in the house here. Two, the Arlington High girls basketball team won their first ever Middlesex League title. So congratulations to both the girls hockey team and the girls basketball team. Um, there'll be a couple new banners at the, uh, the high school for the seasons that they had under very trying circumstances. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? No, no business. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. DeCorsi, you stole some of my new business, which is just occupational hazard being chair, I guess. But I did want to thank to congratulate the girls hockey team and note that uh, one of the stars of the team is our own Ms. Kropelka's granddaughter, Maddie. Um, and then I also did want to acknowledge the boys hockey team who didn't win the Middlesex League, but they had a really interesting year where they started off, they were young and they started off slow and they were winless for about half their season. And then they went on a tear at the end and had a chance to win the Middlesex League, but just lost in overtime, in shootout in overtime um, to get to the finals. But that was a great season for them as well. Um, I've had a few inquiries about the Civilian Advisory Board Study Committee and its creation, its current makeup, and when the first meeting is going to start. So we've had correspondence with the town manager. We're just waiting for a few last designees, but the board office is going to go ahead and, and schedule a meeting to get that going and whatever remaining designees that have to be appointed will just either be appointed by the first meeting or attend at the first meeting. So for those who are have been inquiring about it, it is in process and the first meeting will be scheduled imminently. Um, and then I just, we kind of, we skirted our new business in the last meeting because of the time, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, the passing of Mr. Joe Daly, who was, you know, a staple in town for anyone that's involved in politics. Joe was always present he passed away a few weeks ago and then a few days later his counterpart his wife this the second half of the daily double also passed away and um it's, it's a huge loss for the town joe was a is a large presence in any room that he that he was in so i just wanted to acknowledge that loss for the town and uh we'll miss joe greatly um with that i will entertain a motion to adjourn from was to adjourn. Mr. Diggins, seconded by Second. Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Right before I say yes, it looks like the school committee race in Lexington today, today was decided by one vote. Two candidates, one vote, unofficial results, but I got that from JJ Krasick out of Lexington. So Every vote counts on everything. So yes, move to adjourn. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Janice vote. You all. So long, guys. Good meeting. Good meeting.